Shall we go live, Ludo? Yes. It's a pleasure to welcome everybody uh, to the final presentations of Space, Television, and Architecture, the third and final iteration of a six-part pro seminar that um, Leah Catherine Zaka has been teaching at the Berlaga for the past three springs, two-thirds of that um, uh, ironically um, on the screen, given the content of the seminar. Uh, before uh, giving the screen to Leah Catherine, I'd just like to briefly introduce our guest who will be engaging with our students today. Um, I'd like to welcome Asli Chichek, uh, who is a Brussels-based designer, writer, and educator. She founded her own practice in 2014, focusing on exhibition architecture. Uh, between 2009 and 2020, she was a tutor at the KU Leuven Faculty of Architecture's campuses of Brussels and Ghent. She's currently a professor at Hassel University's uh, Faculty of Architecture and Arts. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Davide Tommaso Ferrando, who is an architecture critic, researcher, and curator. He is currently a research fellow at the Faculty of Design and Art at the Free University of Bozen Bolzano, and also an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Architecture um, at the University of Innsbruck. And it is uh, also fantastic to finally welcome Vanessa Grossman, an architect, uh, historian in modern and contemporary architecture, and a curator. She's assistant professor at the TU Dulles Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment, and in the chair of dwelling. Um, and her book entitled A Concrete um, Alliance, Communism and Modern Architecture in Post-War France is forthcoming from Yale University Press. Um, and finally, just to maybe introduce Leah Catherine, um, an architectural historian who um, is a visiting uh, tutor here at the Berlaga and more importantly, senior lecturer at the University um, of Manchester. Leah, the screen is yours, thank you. Thank you, Salomon. Um, I just want to say that, yeah, we will welcome Asli in a few minutes, um, some problems of connection. Um, so as Salomon said, this is the third and, and final, unfortunately, iteration of this uh, seminar. So it's the third generation of, of Berlage students who have, had this content on uh, television uh, space, television and architecture, where uh, each year we try to investigate the, uh, the this changing relationship between uh, space and time that, that television has brought from the post-war up until, so we kind of cover the period from the post-war up until a uh, very recent time, and, and especially now with um, our life, as Salomon said, um, shifting all on screen. So um, we look at how, for example, the use of television have changed notions of inside and outside, private and public and local and global. So all things that obviously impact uh, on architecture. And the new thing this year was that we, uh, I structured the course a little bit differently around five uh, thematics. So five thematic session, and there was one session which was more methodological. Uh, and those thematics, you will see them today because we will actually go through um, the, the different video essays uh, with following those uh, thematics, which are um, all related to or emanating from television, but of course related to architecture as well. So obsolescence, in um, sorry, obsolescence in materiality, uh, uh, continuities so this idea of television being 24 7 uh, populism and watch films it went from videodrome to the network educating rita and um the truman show so very uh, classic films, um, but some uh, student might have not seen. And then texts were very varied also from, uh, from uh, TV scholars such as Lynn Spiegel or Andrew Goodwin to um, obviously Marshall McLuhan and Baudrillard to architectural scholars that have written on TV already such as Joaquin Moreno, uh, Samuel Dodds and um, 
James Benedict Brown, and finally architects like uh, Andres Hacke, who also wrote a fantastic text about Milano Due. And the new thing also this year was that we had uh, every week a video capsule, I called it video capsule, where we had guests. Uh, Davide Tommaso, who's here today, was one of them, actually. And uh, each of the guests were also related to the one of the thematics. So we had Davide Tommaso Ferrando. We had James Benedict Brown, <clears throat> who uh, teaches in Umea and published a book um, called Mediated Space. We had Joaquin Moreno, uh, who is in Porto and did this fantastic exhibition on the Open University. And finally, we had Dennis Paul, who is actually now at TU Delft um, and also worked on uh, television and democracy. So these video capsules were actually uh, structures as question and answer. So um, I had a series of questions for these guests and the student also had questions and they will be um, also uh, transcribed and um, eventually published somewhere. So you will see actually in the introduction videos some glimpse of those uh, capsules that were great actually. I think it was a great addition not to have just me talking but also some other experts uh, invited. So that's all for me. Uh, today you will see um, 10 video essays. So each student did a three minutes a video essay on, uh, as I say, touching on one of the thematics they had to choose. They had to choose their case studies. And uh, I haven't seen the final final, but I've seen uh, some very uh, almost final versions. And I think I'm quite excited to see the, uh, the outcome and to hear the discussion. We will also go through these videos by pairs, more or less, um, and, and following the thematics. And we'll have a discussion on, uh, after seeing like two video essay, we'll have a discussion rather than on each of them. So that's all for me. Oh, uh, that's great. Thanks, Leah Catherine. Um, we'll start, start the screen share um, next to me and we'll fire up the first uh, video. So the first video is an introduction to the course, right? As movies are, tend to be the content of TV, and as books used to be the content, novels used to be the content of movies, and so every time a new medium arrives, the old medium is the content, and it is highly observable, highly noticeable. But the real, real roughing up and massaging is done by the new medium, and it's, it, it is ignored. So, well, TV is gone, no? No, you just put it in your pocket. No? No one watches it because everybody consumes it. So when I speak about television, I do not mean actually so much, you know, the content of what is broadcasted, but rather the media technical condition of television. It's not only about the content of what is transmitted, but what this medium is able of or capable of, 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 uh, of doing in a, in a political spectrum. So both uh, Silvio Berlusconi in Italy and Donald Trump in America obviously relied heavily on television to construct their political and public image. So they relied on this populist strategy and they used television to feel or to, to appear as closer to the so-called people. This is precisely what the uh, television, uh, the, the contemporary television uh, does today. Not only that, it also transforms us uh, in the products uh, of this uh, con mass consumption uh, phenomenon. So not only we are targeted as, um, as the, 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 the public of this content, we become the content uh, itself, which is a, another step uh, in this uh, sort of transformation <laughs> of society into a commodity, no? Or any of the national broadcasters that are funded by the state are frequently mocked because of their attempts to try and keep some kind of balance, you know, to try and represent 
a fair spectrum of, of information. That it's dedicated not to science, but to the human fact, the human condition, to humanity, to you and me. The important thing is that you're joining millions of other people at their television sets together in a way never before possible. So you see that virtual reality is just another step in this sort of um, impossible task or uh, that, that we give to ourselves uh, to generate this possibility of being in two places at the same time uh, and being immersed uh, in a space that is only an image. And even to the youngest children, I talked about how children used to learn morality from their parents and now I think that Super Mario Brothers before we knew all the myriad changes that they would make in the way that we were and the way we interact and so on. It is, and the way that we engage with this information is moving so quickly that it's very hard to predict where we go next. It feels like every couple of years, um, a new platform emerges, which everyone thinks is going to change everything and then maybe it, subs it builds up and then it subsides. No, McLuhan famously said, if it works, it's obsolete. No? Anything that became mass produced and it's part of shared uh, socio-technical environment is obsolete. It's not cutting edge. No? Thank you. Well, and then I think we can kick off with the first video on the theme of obsolescence. So maybe, um, yeah, so you, you have two videos now on that theme, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, okay. And the first one is uh, titled Cybernetic Television. And is there's, there's a little synopsis of this already? Yeah. Um, well, it's playing now, but we can go back to the synopsis if we want to. Maybe go back. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think it would be nice to know a little bit what we're watching. Well, in that case, Henry, we would you mind it. introducing your, uh, your own video maybe? Yes, so this video essay is a case study of this um, interactive television show that's um, directed inherent from the very first interactive uh, movie, Kino Automat from the uh, World Expo. Um, and by examining this, um, what I would call media event, uh, we can see how this um, television network is built upon the entire nation's um, technology, infrastructure, and architecture. Jedna dvacet, dva a dvacet, tři a dvacet, no to není možný. The story began with a group of 65 people invited to a TV studio in Prague, 1985. They were asked to determine the action of the protagonist in a comedy drama called Rospeky Kaczes Fatabluka with a controller in their hands. Vyžádala. by se si omluvu, studentka, ano. A vy jste šéf, kuchař. Under the delightful atmosphere, 
The show was predominantly governed by the technocracy and the national broadcaster. The technology transmitted the audience's decisions into the network of which the other side was never chief Svatopluka, but the party. My jsme rozhodli variantu ano, teď zbašníte kotouč, puste variantu ano. Vážení přátelé, vy doma. However, the extent of the television network reached far beyond the studio and households to the nation's power grid. At Posseridi, the second generator block was just put into operation. Manipulating peak load thus became a golden opportunity to demonstrate the prosperity and power of the country. When the camera switched to the control room, the once non-human and unfamiliar space of the power dispatch office then turned into part of the television stage and entered the domestic space of every audience. No, podle měření zde na sále předpokládáme, že převahu měla druhá skupina. The voting mechanism based on monitoring fluctuation in current didn't last long, because engineers soon realized the power supply was not actually as stable as they thought. The crew later turned the camera to Seedlist Darblis. This colossal housing complex was already an iconic image of the capital and a set for several other TV series. Nevertheless, converting it to a voting mechanism ripped the architecture from its urban and historical context, functioning as an autonomous control room for the audience nationwide. As the script structure revealed that every plot twist would eventually come to the same result, this modified cybernetic theatre never really gave the feedback channel that allowed the mass to become a public. Nothing of Czech people and their life were really shown on the screen in the studio, on the readings in the control room, or on the facade of the housing estate during the air of Rospiki Kutcher Svatopluka. But how the network infrastructure of television fragmented and reassembled space and architecture into incoherent components of the national propaganda machine. Thank you, Hang. Yeah, and before uh, starting the next video, I'd like to introduce the, the video I say uh, I made. Um, my name is Michael. We also saw during the video introduction, uh, Marshall McLuhan talk about hybridization, like crossing of one technology with another. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at in this um, visual essay. So when you're ready, Ryan, you can play number two. In the late 1970s, computers and video game consoles start to enter the living room, accompanying the already present television set. By adding an extra device, family members can directly influence and manipulate what they see on the screen for the first time, transforming the passive activity of watching television into an interactive experience. However evolutionary, the interaction remains limited within this space and to the participants in it. Okay, players at home, you got to use your cube. It's time to tell Heathcliff which team you'd like to play with. Now, this is your cube. First thing you do is to put yourself in touch with us here at the Magic Circus by touching button number one up in the upper left-hand corner and touching the center button, which is C. That's the community channel. That's where we are, because we're community. <laughs> in 1977, the world's first commercial interactive TV service launches in Columbus, Ohio. Cube introduces viewers to new concepts in television, including pay-per-view, on-demand programming, and live participation. Through an 18-button remote, users can directly influence what they see on screen, connecting to broadcasting stations through miles of copper wire. Contrasting from video cassette recorders and game consoles, the home set communicates back and forth with a remote station. Television show through my and programming first touching button number one up in the upper left hand corner and touching the center button which is C. That's the community channel. That's where we are because we're community. <laughs> in 1977, the world's first commercial interactive TV service launches in Columbus, Ohio. 
Cube introduces viewers to new concepts in television, back in time, so, uh, including pay-per-view, on-demand programming, on like and live participation. Through an 18-button remote, users can directly influence what they see on screen, connecting to broadcasting stations through miles of copper wire. Contrasting from video cassette recorders and game consoles, the home set communicates back and forth with a remote station. Sorry, we had some uh, technicality. We're going to be right back where we are. giving viewers the option to vote and influence what will happen next, only with the touch of a button. Viewers now not only have control over what happens in their living rooms, but influence what happens in other living rooms too. Cube connects living rooms throughout Columbus and all the viewers in them, making them participants in a collective television experience. However, the expensive infrastructure required to support the service, along with a decline of subscribers, eventually lead to the discontinuation of Cube. Ik ben ook zo benieuwd naar. Ah, dat is goed, goed. Het ultieme Nederlandse muziekkanaal. In the Netherlands of the 2000s, I spent many of my teenage afternoons flipping television channels. Music stations often functioned as a welcome distraction to homework sessions, connecting the living room to places elsewhere. Aside from a localized version of MTV, two other music channels were broadcast TMF and The Box, which both reached out to their viewers by running interactive programming. Contrary to Cube, they managed this not by using a proprietary cable network, but by using cell phones and dial-up internet. Telephone lines now connected teenagers all over the Netherlands to television networks, allowing them to talk back to their television through text message services and browser-based chat boxes, further expanding the already extended living room. Although the technology surrounding cable television remained mostly the same, the addition of the telephone transformed the traditional television into a communal interactive device, a hybrid media experience. By 2011, technology had provided a new paradigm for music distribution, resulting in the shutting down of the box and TMF. Pocket sized, wirelessly connected and battery operated, the smartphone can do what television did and more. Mobile and capable of functioning in any environment, it offers television the opportunity to reclaim its space in the living room. From this permanent position, this could lead to new hybrid forms of television experiences and a reimagining of the environment it occupies. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, just uh, want to apologize for uh, a, a uh, um, uh, interaction malfunction. Let's say we went back in time and uh, okay. watched uh, part of the video again. Um, so the idea is to have a, a short discussion now after those two that those two video that I would say tackled obsolescence, uh, the obsolescence of modes of interactivity with um, between the space and the television. Um, I think, uh, Davide, you know very well this um, Czech uh, example, so I'm sure you can uh, say a lot more on it. Um, but I will just uh, maybe ask who, whoever wants to start now uh, between uh, Davide, Vanessa and uh, Asli um, should just go. Um, yeah. So maybe any comments to, to just start the discussion or... Hello, and sorry for my delay, but I think I'm going to leave the other two colleagues to start because I have seen the works a bit, so maybe it's more interesting. Yeah, so know. I should just mention that Asli was with us in a sort of mid-step, uh, so she's seen... Um, uh, I thought it was also interesting to invite her again because she's seen the work in progress uh, and so already commented on, on a partial uh, state of those videos. I don't know, maybe Davide, you want to start? Yeah, sure, uh, Lea. Yeah? Uh, sure, sure. Um, actually, I was quite fascinated by, uh, of course, the um, the literature that I had found on the case of the um, uh, chef Svatopluk, which I, which I don't remember if we discussed, uh, probably we did uh, when I had my time capsule, um, was already quite uh, uh, configuring a dystopic scenario of propaganda and manipulation by the media, but the way in which it has been told uh, in this short video makes it even more dystopic, I have to say. So probably I missed something in translation because I only found the, 
uh, writings in, in, in Czech, but this, and which I translated, of course, roughly through <laughs> Google Translate. But I really enjoyed, of course, this uh, re-interpretation, uh, re-description re of this uh, specific um, case. I, uh, I have written down, uh, and of course, also the, the, the second one, Cube, was something also in my uh, radar, but I didn't know that much about it. So I'm, uh, as, as always, uh, at finals, uh, um, creeds Crete also learn. So um, actually, if the topic of these two first videos was was that of, of obsolescence, there's a couple of things that which I wrote down, which I maybe do not directly tackle this topic, but I think is quite interesting. Of course, the two examples which have been shown um, somehow really deal with two main uh, spheres, uh, like I mean, the public sphere and the pu private sphere. So the two differences are very clear to me. So the way in which you can uh, articulate the, the, the technology of interaction, we could say of the interaction through TV as from the point of view of the public uh, uh, or as from the point of view of private, let's say consumption of goods, even if consumption exists in both um, in both cases, but maybe the thing which really becomes obsolete, if, if I have to compare these two examples to what we experience nowadays, is precisely this idea of the mass. No, so basically, both the Shep Svatopluk, uh, uh, the TV show, and I can imagine also Cube was somehow addressing the population of, of the nation, let's say, as a mass. Uh, this is something that we have somehow, I guess, forgotten in a way, because we know that we've been, uh, I mean, individualization in contemporary society is basically fragmenting and making this concept of the mass obsolete because we all live now in small communities, much, much smaller than the ones who, which were probably addressed uh, by these um, TV shows and uh, technologies, uh, communities which are actually multiple at the same time. So we share several communities at the same time and i uh, i can imagine that maybe one of the reasons for uh, uh but or maybe this is more like actually a question that i would pose to the students uh, how would they see uh, the, the the specific kind of um, discourse that is generated and relationship that is generated to the nation in these examples if compared to what we experience today no i mean uh, now of course we have our smartphones uh, and we generate our own small communities but is there and uh, is, is there a possibility to still speak of something which somehow addresses us as a nation or as a continent or as a i don't know a, a region and so on i think these are all uh, notions that have been questioned uh, recently and which make everything much more complex i would say uh, from this point of view and then one thing which i also would like to highlight which i find very um, Interesting, and this uh, maybe emerges even more clearly in the first of the two uh, uh, videos, is that is how technologies uh, not simply te technological innovation doesn't simply configures uh, new devices, but also configures new, uh, let's say, um, subjects of consumption. No, it's actually quite an interesting topic. The fact that in the mind of the device, there's always not simply the the, the tool in itself, but also the user. So the ideal user, what kind of user do you want to shape? by means of this technology and i think that the very first example shows it quite clearly uh, it, also if you know the story like the, the kind of ideal um, citizen that uh, the uh, uh, politicians had in mind while they were shaping the whole interactive uh, process was actually quite uh, quite interesting to me but this can always apply so every time there's a technology the user is also always incorporated in it even if we not, not necessarily uh, see it in the first place I don't know if it, this can Thank generate you. discussion, yeah, but yeah. I, this is how I wanted to react <laughs> as the first uh, reaction to the whole uh, afternoon, let's say. I think that, um, thank you for that, David. It's great. The idea of the mass uh, was also quite present in, I don't remember, uh, Hang, how you said it exactly in your video, but this idea that the architecture of the block it doesn't is not, it's almost not architecture anymore because it becomes a machine for you know, for this um, recording of the mass opinion or so I think that's quite visual how this idea of the mass is, is translated from the medium to the uh, physical uh, uh, milieu or um, maybe Vanessa, if you I don't know if you have something to follow up on this or yeah, I'm uh, well, thank you so much for both films. It's very interesting. Of course, I'm I think I'm the only one who's kind of landing here for the first time, but I've been yeah. all trying to follow the, the program of, of the pro seminar. I was very interested uh, 
Um, and of course, when the remote control appeared in both films, I kept thinking of my son and I will go back to that. But for the first film, I was very interested in the kind of many ideas came to mind in terms of uh, issues of censorship, monopoly, and, uh, and even, you know, when you talk about national propaganda machines, so how many TV chains, uh, you know, what is the kind of, uh, let's say, what are the options for the viewers and, and how is that controlled? So I was very interested in this civic dimension of television that somehow refers back to my childhood uh, while growing, having been, I mean, I'm not so old, but a little bit old to be born in a, during the dictatorship period. And I remember how TV was, uh, had this civic dimension. And in the second film, I'm uh, going back to my son, he really fails to understand, he's six years old, that whenever something is on TV, uh, he says, I don't want to watch it anymore. And he, 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 even though he wants to stay in the, in the, you know, in the, in the children's uh, channel, somehow he doesn't understand that he can control because it's really, really used to the iPhone. So I was very interested in this notion also of prosthetics, you know, how the remote control somehow, you know, so it becomes part of, uh, well, uh, of your body and uh, you can move around and, 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 and at some point it becomes environmental less. So um, I think it's very interesting the way this was um, tackled in the in the film and very, yeah, it's very interesting. So I'm not sure if uh, you can say something about those two dimensions. Maybe, um, maybe Michael, uh, I don't know if you want to say a bit more about uh, in, in relation to what uh, Vanessa just said with the cube, because the cube, obviously, uh, the remote control was um, at the center of this uh, experiment. I have to say it was also to come back to what Davide said, um, cube was an experiment that never really took off. So it was only in Columbus, Ohio, and it never really, I mean, I think I remember when I was uh, also a child having something similar with like a lot of button, but I don't think it was the same. So this very particular um, uh, experiment that was run by um, um, Amex, uh, American Express and, and Warner Brother was uh, was only uh, in Columbus, Ohio. But, but the, the yeah, the remote controller, a, a very particular remote control was very really at the center of the of, of, of Cube. So I don't know if you want to say more on that, Michael. Well, perhaps to add on that, indeed, um, uh, uh, what I read on it or found on it is that it was indeed a I mean, there was maybe several tens of thousands of uh, users being able to use it, but it was also quite expensive, not only at, for subscribers, but also for, uh, well, to maintain the service, they had to make all this extra infrastructure, uh, landlines, uh, so it's, you know, well, physical landlines. Um, so, uh, yeah, it makes sense, or at a certain point, television found a way to find other methods to uh, to establish that connection. I think back and forth between the, the viewer, the watcher at home and the, the, the television station. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's well, going back to my childhood, let's say or my teenage years, that, that phone is really uh, the instrumental thing in making television uh, interactive there. Now we all have a, we all have a phone, so we all have the power in a sense. But uh, obviously, the remote control is very much linked to the idea of power in in the house, or used to be. You know, it's like there was one remote control, and whoever had it in their hand had had the control. Um, and there was also some obviously gender um, issues with that. And there's um, um, some old uh, publicity that I think we might have seen in, in the lecture, some old publicity for remote control. Often um, it's like the woman who holds the, you know, the woman of the house and it shows also this kind of um, power uh, taken over the, the family because it's whoever has the remote control in their hand can, can decide, obviously. Mm. Um, I would like to, I'd like, I, uh, sorry, someone else talking? No, no, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go, go, go. Okay. No, I was, um, I was just thinking with these two videos again, seeing them also having progressed since uh, last time I've seen them. But what connects them to me also is that um, that TV and how or this national propaganda, but also this idea of selling a product, how that is through the medium of the television is of course reduced to the mass ideology or 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 uh, mass consumption. And that made, of course, the space is also a little bit, yeah, disappear. I mean, all of a sudden you don't go to a shop, but you can do you can do it with a telephone, but you can still see the product. And you do um, 
uh, you do not go uh, to these areas which are shown or you don't do this kind of, you don't have to take part in the mass um, demonstration, but you, it's, it's brought to your house. So this kind mm -hmm. of, um, yeah, this kind of so-called uh, border between this private and public is of course extremely, um, yeah, it's, it's transgressed, it's, it doesn't happen. So actually, even if you don't want, you still have it in this box and it's your remote controlled by, you know, allowing these activities inside or the ideology. So the spatial aspect is just a decor. It's a kind of set, it's a stage. And that is of course how at certain moments, television was perhaps um, used in a constructive way and other moments again, not. Then it's when things started to of course get, I mean, I'm, I come from Turkey, I grew up in Turkey and you know, every day and um, every night state television closed um, at 12 o'clock with the marching of the soldiers when I was little. And when my father was in the military, I waited until 12, just because I thought I was gonna see him because he was in the military. But of course, closing every night with the military marching, that is 80s after the military coup in, um, uh, in Turkey. So that had a message, you know? So, I mean, you watch your last movie and then you have to see the military, whether you wanted it or mm. not. And that sense is of course a device which is spatially, but also, um, uh, right, which, which uses the space sometimes, it's showing a bit in the, um, let's say, in the manipulation of a certain idea or consumption. Both. So that's what I kind of caught again by watching these two, two films. Yeah. Also, uh, to go back to what Vanessa was saying, the, the civic space is not just the space of consumption, but the civic space, because one of the things, for example, that was on Cube was a channel, a community channel where the TV becomes the kind of um, assembly room. So you could vote, for example, uh, what, what would you like to, what would you like the government to do with your taxes, remove the, remove more snow or build a better road or so the, the, the remote control or the television becomes, or the living room becomes the civic space in a way or replaces the civic space. And I, I mean, uh, thinking of what Asli just said, I, in thinking of monopoly and thinking also back of my, you know, childhood, I would say that not only TV organize, organized, uh, well, I think the remote control somehow liberated the, it a little bit, but in terms of the, the, the kind of family dynamics, as you say, whoever has the remote control or is in control of the TV, uh, uh, but also time, I remember when there is monopoly and five TV chains, for example, I mean, we don't have, back, back in the days, we didn't have all this uh, open TV. So I remember just looking at TV, I would know what time of the day it would be. So I would say that is a device that really organized time and space uh, uh, in its, uh, let's say, in one of its, uh, in its previous edition. And, 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 and as we open, of course, uh, uh, to all the, the, the possibilities, I think this temporal dimension somehow, at least in my life, uh, was lost. But in a country like Brazil, for example, for whoever has the means, everyone has one, it's one TV per room. This is the average of a kind of a upper middle class. Uh, so this is how TV is, uh, every, so mm. in order to kind of come to turn to that family dynamics of the past, where the whole family is gathering in the living room watching something, this is how, I mean, TV is to this day spatialized in, uh, you know, domestic life. But I would say this temporal dimension that Asli mm -hmm. was, you know, it, it's something that really organized my own life uh, in, back in the day. So I think it's very strong. If I may add one thing, there's um, something which I also noted down while I was watching the uh, both uh, videos, which to me is actually quite interesting, which is a uh, has to do with the issue of domestication of technology, no? in the sense that uh, from the moment in which this new, this is the same that which happened to radio. So radio, when it became a domestic uh, device, uh, it started to be surrounded by this uh, cabinet of wood to make it something familiar and acceptable because of the strangeness and newness of this uh, unfamiliar technology, which was connecting you to other invisible spaces and so on. And this, uh, the, the aesthetics, therefore, not only the, um, let's say the political value, but also the aesthetics of these tools is kind of, very important to make them become part of ordinary life. And this is something we could easily see like in this uh, cube um, uh, remote control with the clown presenting it as something funny and so on. This is really something that is meant to cut the tension for this strange thing, which is starting to approach your everyday uh, life, the ordinary uh, life. And somehow the very same thing applies, I would say in the chef Svatopluk where you have these big red buttons with the big names, they, be, they are like look like toys, 
uh, but indeed they're much more than that. No, they are uh, technologies for control and so on and so forth. And this is really something we can easily see in, in the smartphone, which is, uh, accordingly is probably the new television, we could say. And now instead of one TV, TV per room, there's one TV per person, <laughs> mostly. Um, and of course, the, the smartphone is much more than a phone, but we call it still a smartphone because it, is, it reminds us of something familiar that we can manage. But of course, it is uh, something that goes completely beyond and therefore transforms completely the way in which we live, uh, let's say, uh, domestic, but also urban space, as a matter of fact. Thank you. We need to move. I'm sure some of those topics will come back, uh, back and back, but we need to move, I think, uh, right to the second uh, block of, of videos. It will be on uh, immateriality, I think. Yes, so the first uh, video essay in immateriality is titled The Fourth Wall, which is about a particular technological innovation that um, redefines the relationship of the audience with the characters on screen and thus tends to disrupt the boundaries between the real space and the fictional space. Traditional theater stages were box sets made up of three walls. Illusionary techniques developed in 19th century theater introduced a fourth wall, a performance convention in which an imaginary wall separates the audience from the actors. Breaking the fourth wall is an instance in which this performance convention is violated by actors by either directly referring to the viewers. Did you think I'd forgotten you? Perhaps you hoped I had. The movie has a movie. Yeah, oh, Abed, cancel us. And while you're at it, why don't you take your cutesy, I can't tell life from TV gimmick with you. You know, it's very season one. Or the character's fictionality. This is ridiculous. Hey, we play to a, a very sophisticated television audience. They know Maurice is not going to kill Nikolai, and they definitely know that Nikolai is not going to kill Maurice. Wait a minute, Flashman, you can't just take it upon yourself to step out of character. Nobody yelled cut. There you are, Zach. I've been looking all over for I, you. You time out. <laughs> and is now widely applied in all possible media forms to breathe new life into it and even allow audiences to develop an intimacy with the characters. <laughs> <laughs> He's a bit annoying, actually. What is that? What? That thing that you're doing. It's like you disappear. What? What are you not telling me? Nothing. Tell me what's going on underneath Nothing. there. Nothing. Tell me. Come on, no. tell me. Nothing. <laughs> Media psychologists describe our relationship with characters as parasocial, one-sided relationships that we tend to develop with the media we consume. 20th century mass media has challenged the assumption that relationships solely occur amongst real people and has recognized that media consumers are absorbed by compelling media characters. Media creators use the fourth wall breaking to show a preference for the audience by developing a very intimate and personal relationship with them through these compelling characters. Viewers typically feel involved to some extent in these fictional events depicted on screens and experience the imaginary participation with the characters, especially through technological innovations with close-up camera angles and editing techniques that disrupt the spatial distance between the audience and the characters with face-to-face -face interaction. Breaking the fourth wall is also used to highlight the artificiality of the media form itself, as it calls to attention the actor's awareness of being in fiction, making the stage it sets visible to viewers, effectively bringing the audience into the work of art. The architectural setting of these highly curated sets are intentionally deceptive for the audiences, and this technique tends to reveal the fake backdrops, ceilings of cameras, and missing walls that would otherwise be impossible to conceive while watching the film. Media creators are the masters of illusion, and using the fourth wall technique gives a momentary snap from the fancied fictional world into the reality of scripted stage sets.
Yes, yeah, so the next video we are going to see uh, goes under the title Lean and on, In and On Camera. And uh, the study case is uh, uh, we are using tweets, the world's uh, leading uh, live streaming, streaming platform. And we examine how this influence the private spaces and also how it uh, transforms our society into a commodity. Okay, 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 okay. I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it. Around the 2000s, the main consensus expected that the internet is the new medium that was likely to kill television. However, it has completely revolutionized it. Twitch, the world's leading live streaming platform, a subsidiary of Amazon.com, launched in 2011 as a video game live streaming platform, but has recently expanded its content to creative and in real life streams. What made Twitch so popular? Launched as Justin TV in 2007, the site was divided into several content categories. However, in June 2011, the company decided to spin off the gaming content as Twitch TV. Pretty quickly we realized they were not that interesting, but we needed to do something else. So we turned Justin TV into a platform for anyone to create live video content. Pretty soon after that, people who were much more interesting than us started, started broadcasting and that's when it really took off. Since then, Twitch has attracted more than 35 million unique visitors a month. On August 25th, 2014, Amazon acquired Twitch Interactive for 970 million in an all-cash deal. What makes Twitch different? Twitch is predominantly interactive, which means that the broadcaster is in constant communication with the audience. Well, thank you so much, thank you. However, oh, contrary to YouTube, that is meant for lasting content, Twitch is only working when you live stream. Unlike YouTube, where a new channel might wind up being suggested, Twitch likes to only recommend those streams with high amounts of viewers. All you need to do is become a Twitch affiliate and you can start monetizing your channel. To become an affiliate, you need 500 minutes broadcast over 7 days, an average of 3 viewers and at least 50 followers. Twitch pays streamers by ads. Streamers can also receive direct donations from oh viewers. <laughs> Felix, thank you so much for giving Donations awesome. via PayPal donation button or other monetary exchange platforms give 0% to Twitch. That type of platform is not only changing the way we consume television, but also the way we produce it by turning our private room into studio floors. A video camera and a piece of audio equipment are now more than enough to convert our home into a television production studio. So I, I, I have to ask about your background there because you have one of the coolest looking rooms that we've featured on this show. Is that, is that a set? <laughs> um, my room, this is my, this is my bedroom. This is I where love I Nowadays, society is being transformed into, into the content itself, rather than the public of this content. It is being transformed into a commodity. Now that everything becomes a setup, how do we deal with the architecture of everyday life?
thank you for these two um, following videos. So um, again, I mean, Davide is a, an expert of Twitch. Uh, he talked about it. I, I, I was almost, um, almost knew nothing about it as an, a good old, um, but, uh, but Davide talked about it uh, a, a bit when, when he was um, in the class, right? Um, and, and now I understood better the difference between, between YouTube and Twitch, um, thanks to your uh, film, Georgia, because I have to say it was still a bit unclear to me, but, but Twitch is always live, right? That's the difference. Yes, it is always live, and it was recently, David, that uh, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, they started using the on-demand videos. But the idea is that you cannot, you have to always to be live uh, in order to uh, broadcast. There is actually, if I may intervene here, uh, which of course, uh, again, these are um, subjects that I'm very much keen of. Uh, there's this uh, very interesting movie, uh, which I, I think by now can be watched for free online, which is um, Republic of Desire, uh, Public Republic of Desire, Common Republic of Desire. Ba basically, it's a movie about how these uh, streaming platforms in China are being used to generate a um, incredible economy um, of, um, basically I can imagine can be paralleled by what we know of Twitch. But uh, now, uh, according to this uh, documentary, there are even competitions among uh, streamers who during several days uh, do some sort of streaming marathon and the winner is the one who gets more revenues from the people watching them, which generates a source of several strange loops of uh, the amount and, uh, of content which is produced per day and also the kind of content that is produced. I mean, it, it is a, actually a very, very uh, interesting and growing uh, phenomenon, which by now has, been, uh, has become, let's say, common. Uh, the topics which have been dealt with in both videos are, uh, uh, I think, very on point and very, very clear. I see in the second one uh, a promising beginning of a typological research, which I think still has to be done in a more, let's say, systematized uh, and um, organic way, because, of course, uh, from the moment in which the room becomes a set, uh, how do you start to work with this set in order to uh, deliver the kind of uh, also symbolical content that you want to deliver through the streaming. And this reminds me actually maybe of a couple of uh, uh, things which I've been also noting down, uh, which actually is a point of contact in between the two videos. Uh, for sure, the, 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 the notion of intimacy, no? how it's been re-articulated, uh, um, the, 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 the people looking through the, the screen in the movies, but also like the way in which you directly address the, the, the viewership. Uh, in Twitch generates this sort of um, closeness, this tension, which has been exploited, of course. Uh, it's not simply the fact of looking to the camera, it's really the, the fact of unveiling certain details uh, or certain features of your own uh, private sphere, which is a way of seducing no? the eye of the observer. I will always remember when uh, the uh, far right party in Italy uh, um, led by Matteo Salvini, uh, won a, sub a substantial amount of votes at the last European elections. Uh, and you would have Matteo Salvini from the Lega uh, party showing a, a picture of himself on Facebook and Instagram, of course, um, holding a piece of paper with, with written like the number of votes and thank you. But behind him, you would have a library with a lot of objects uh, and each object, each of these objects tells a story, basically, because it was a, a clearly inform, staged informal set. So it was a staged informality. And this somehow bridges, I think, the, uh, the speculation about uh, domestic uh, space, about architecture, from the, even from the scale of the uh, furniture to the scale of the objects. <laughs> because really, uh, you start to have a, a narrative relationship with each one of the objects which are suddenly seen. Uh, in front of the in front of the camera, which is what, which is why I also believe that this typological research that was being suggested in floor plan here uh, in this case would necessarily need uh, some sort of also let's say reconfiguration and description of what you actually see in front of the camera. Each single corner of this of this rectangle, which is the rectangle of the webcam, is a corner which can be filled with content, and this is basically I would say how. Uh, these people who are um, self-conscious about their presence online uh, do uh, design uh, these uh, 2D, 3D space in which they are uh, um, uh, placed. 
Um, and then just a funny fact, uh, I don't remember if Justin V, Justin TV is the, let's say the origin of Twitch, if I remember correctly, but uh, I, I kind of remember there was like the very, like the archeological grandfather of all this uh, phenomenon would be a, sor a, a sort of TV program of, uh, of a guy who started to uh, broadcast himself, his life 24 seven and going around with this uh, camera uh, and uh, connected to a cable uh, TV. And he would show himself uh, really from morning to evening, everything he would do, every place he would go in a way that it really reminds us of, of course, Truman Show, but even more of the, the circle, this uh, very uh, nice novel, uh, which is also at a certain point about broadcasting yourself 24 seven. The movie is really bad, but the novel is uh, actually quite mm. good. Um, so yeah, th these things are, as a matter of fact, somehow, connected, I, I would say. Again, I don't, it's not a question, but a, a reaction. Thanks. I think this stage in formality, we all, we all have it now, right? We suddenly in the last year and a half all had to. And, and, and this moment that Georgia catched on, um, on Twitch by coincidence, where the, the woman is asked about the, the background being her be real bedroom or not, is quite, is quite revealing in that sense. Someone else? Uh, so. Maybe me. <laughs> um, well, both both films uh, uh, start with they improved also again because there's now a much uh, better dynamic in both of them. Um, also, the 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 way we are introduced to the um, Twitch uh, part works better than I think when I saw it a few weeks ago. Um, but, well, I actually remember them also quite well because they are the ones which I found the most directly kind of connecting to architectural space, like to an interior, to a stage, to, to a set. Um, and this, uh, the, the fourth wall uh, specifically is, I think it tells us a lot about architecture composing a space without talking about this so directly, or it, it talks, I mean, you, you speak over the set design. Um, over a lot of compos compositorial elements. Uh, it also reminds me a lot uh, to this book, which uh, Steve, ja Steve Jacobs um, from uh, Belgium has once uh, brought out, a very nice book, uh, it's called The Wrong Architect. And he uh, drew the floor plans, um, or he let the students draw the floor plans of Hitchcock movies, because Hitchcock was very involved with his, with his scenography, with his sets. And of course, they um, yeah they saw that many. If you would start to follow each scene and draw it and put them together, these houses, most of them, they just couldn't exist. They they it was impossible. I mean, the, the staircase didn't lead anywhere. Or, I mean, it's a very good, it's a very good book. So I would I highly recommend to take it if you don't know it yet. And it's of course what happens in the set design, and then what does not happen in architecture, or maybe sometimes we try to. But in either case, there's. Um, uh, my fascination about these two movies is this direct, um, uh, yeah, or very more direct link to more classical conventional idea of architecture, let's say. And, um, and also, of course, what happens with Twitch or with our backgrounds is that we can, we can put a background, but we cannot redesign our space each time. It's not a set. I mean, it's a given set. And all of a sudden it becomes our, our room of, of communication. And that I think is even a kind of comparative, uh, let's say duality or even uh, more opposing examples perhaps, but very much fitting into this group of immateriality. So, so far my, uh, my remarks also as a kind of someone who's, as someone who's called more and more as a scenographer, although I'm not, but somehow the scenographic and set design elements is of course very much part of the architectural work. Thank you. Yeah, if I, if I may, I would say that uh, both films really uh, uh, brought to, to my, uh, let's say, imaginary. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if you two are familiar with Poltergeist, but this image of, uh, you know, this kind of em empathic relation with television, uh, you know, and, and the, the little girl, when I was a kid, I was very afraid of this movie. Uh, and in which, you know, the, the girl somehow is sucked into TV and it becomes a window where she's paranoid and she hears noises. So I'm not sure if Poltergeist was somehow a reference for you um, or if, yeah, if it came to mind uh, while uh, thinking of the movie. But I, I thought that your film focused a lot on the content and how, you know, the content was really geared toward, towards promoting this kind of empathy and uh, towards the, you know, the viewer. 
But I was wondering if you had any kind of reflection about the device itself, you know, television moving from uh, a piece of furniture to more and more uh, kind of a window like almost immaterial device. Uh, did it play, uh, you know, in the conception of your film? Did you consider that at all? Um, so at least maybe in my film, um, in the beginning, I show this transition of how the theater is, you know, like it's, it's a live performance. And I, I feel that in that case, the this act of breaking the fourth wall is even trickier compared to a television screen where the camera does the job um, in a way where this distance is disrupted. But I mentioned that uh, this face to face interaction and things like uh, these like these um, elements, basically, they make it more easy for the audience to uh, directly relate to the characters. So in that sense, I feel like the te like television has made um, very easily broken this boundary between the two dimensions of real and fiction. Yeah. But the evolution of the design of TV, because the first TVs were almost like a piece of furniture, right? Is this something that uh, actually you were interested in? Well, it, it didn't really come up as um, while we were making the video essays, but it definitely came up uh, during the discussions throughout the uh, throughout the seminar, for sure. Because we started um, our readings, which we uh, had for the seminar, we started reading about obsolescence, and that really focused on the uh, impact of television within a domestic space. And we started looking at how original TV sets were placed in living rooms, and now they go into bedrooms, so how... Uh, it becomes an essential component in, in uh, designing a house. Thank you, Thank you Nishi. Um, someone else has a comment, also students, if you want to um, continue on some of the points or pick up on the discussion, don't um, feel shy. Also, maybe I just wanted to say, um, I don't know about poltergeist, but um, it seems like a good reference to look into now. So thanks for that. Yeah, there's actually a lot of, uh, sorry, Vanessa, there's actually a lot of films that I, as, as I said, I include five films in, in this um, in this seminar and every week we discussed one, but they, they were obviously others. Maybe that's one to include. Uh, yeah, this is one that really, when I was a kid, this film horrified me. And for many years, I was afraid of TVs because of it. So it's just a, a reference that, uh, yeah, I would like to evoke here. <laughs> Maybe one thing I can add, um, uh, which is actually a, I think it could be something that I could also say at the very end, because it's something that comes uh, up every time I see one of these uh, videos. Uh, which has to do with the systems of representation. Uh, um, these media basically, I think, put us in, this, in front of the same question that uh, Venturi and Scott Brown, uh, Eisenhower were asking themselves in front of Las Vegas, so how to find a system of representation for the new city that Las Vegas was somehow uh, producing. Um, when we see uh, this sort of um, city, which is made of a network of rooms, uh, which is material and immaterial at the same time. Uh, and we see some attempts of representing this space, which somehow uh, goes in the background, um, as uh, Asli said before, but at the same time becomes a stage and so on. I, I'm wondering, and again, this is a sort of, um, not a question, but a, a speculation I'm doing right now, if uh, and how would we uh, uh, experiment with systems of representation capable of actually constructing visually these, these spaces that we are only discussing by showing videos uh, right now. I mean, the, 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 how the space actually um, uh, offers itself through the screen uh, enough. No? I mean, is there another way of representing this sort of uh, multiple network uh, material and material space that allows us to start discussing it in a different way? Because of course, our, our, our uh, discourse uh, and narratives are limited also by the system of representation, which for the moment coincides basically with how we perceive this space. I think it's an interesting gap to somehow fill in, a, in the perspective of future development of this, uh, of this topic. Now, how to find a way to represent, to make it, to, to, to make it somehow controllable or, uh, or at, le at least discussable in, a, in, a, in more complex ways. Yeah, 
yeah, I think there was some attempt to do that in some of the videos more this year, I would say, than, mm -hmm. than last year. But I agree that it's uh, something, especially teaching these kind of topics in the School of Architecture, obviously. So I don't have an answer, but... Good. I think we will move. Uh, we're a little bit late on our schedule. Uh, we were supposed to take a break until 3.15. Uh, I suggest we make it a bit, uh, maybe we do a bit shorter break until 3.20 or something like that. Would that, would that be good? So we'll be only five minutes uh, delayed on schedule. So... We see you back in 13 minutes. Charles. See you. Ciao.
Okay. Who is going next? Uh, democracy? Yeah. yeah, so it's you, Anna, and Masha. Uh, Masha. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm Masha, I'm from Russia, and um, uh, this is the, the first uh, video serve on the democracy uh, that uh, revealed through the series of footages uh, how the TV can be used as a political tool from the Cold War uh, to nowadays. Most thinking Americans now recognize the fact that our country is at war, a war declared against us by the rulers of international communism. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate 
this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace. Washington became increasingly concerned that the religious issue would jeopardize new anti-communist military campaigns. The condition being that all capitalist nations capitulate. So to the communist, peace means destroy the capitalist country. Новый виток вооружений маскирует новой волной лжи и ненависти. A small Salvation Army soup kitchen in Moscow fills with hungry people. But many are also migrant laborers. Смартфона Кенсингтон Авеню в первой исторической столице США фираются у мусорных баков посреди заваленной хламом улицы. У нас нет разногласий с Соединенными Штатами. У них есть только одно разногласие. Они хотят сдерживать наше развитие. Говорят об этом публично. Russia responded by sending troops to seize control of Crimea and backing an armed insurgency in eastern Ukraine. У российских границ группировка войск США усиливается. Сейчас Запад перебрасывает войска из континентальной части Северной Америки через Атлантику в Европу. The control and influence most of the Eastern European countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, which is Putin's objective. США будут бороться изо всех сил за свое положение глобального доминирования. Okay, now we move to the to design a thon. Good afternoon, my name is Anna, and the next video essay that we're going to watch uh, tells the story of design a thon, a uh, design participatory process led by architects that use uh, both the television and the telephone for citizen participation. The Neologism Designathon refers to a long, uninterrupted period during which designs are made through collective thinking. Between 1976 and 1985, American architects Chad Floyd and Charles Moore used this term to name a participatory process that involves citizen workshops aired on television. The designathon concept is an offshoot of the 1960s telethon. Combining television and marathon, telethons were big fundraising events held to raise money for a charitable or political cause, using the telephone as a new multimedia experience. That's terrific! Introducing a new approach to the telethon concept, the Phil Donahue show was broadcasted in Daytown, Ohio in 1970. Instead of asking for charity donations, the show dealt with contemporary issues in a format where the expert was the center of attention. Spontaneity, improvised scripts, and interaction with public opinion were guarantees of success. So in 1976, following a call for tender in Daytown, Designathon was approved for broadcasting on the local TV channel. One of the ways that is manifest and that I, one that I think of particular interest is the use of videotapes to interest people in urban design. 
how and where and under what circumstances and to what effect have you used that device? It's actually not videotapes, but live TV. Merging telethon and talk show techniques, a series of six hour long planning charrettes were broadcasted live for eight years. So it's your ideas that are going to make this whole downtown area you have Using the phone as parallel infrastructure, viewers were able to call into the program and voice their comments and ideas, which were sketched and discussed through questionnaires, models, and drawings made in real time. Is that very feasible? Yeah, it's simple, I think. The democratic approach of the program was inspired by thinkers such as Henry Lefebvre, Jane Jacobs, and the formulation of advocacy planning, the Synathon, was a formal proposition of what the thinkers arrived at but the broadcasts became a real mechanism for transforming the technical discourse of architects and urban policy makers into an intelligible discourse to a broader audience. Uh, I'm going to read a statement. In spite of television making promising strides towards becoming a medium for participatory design, the program was curtailed in 1984 due to the Reagan administration's cuts in funding and deregulation of broadcasting which severely affected local TV channels. I'm sure it'll be perfect. The 80s saw the emergence of various shows focused on interior design, with designers physically appearing during construction phases. Architects, however, have not returned in the flesh to the center of the television screen to discuss concepts and ideas reaching not only to ordinary citizens, but also politicians. In response to the Global Village, coined by Marshall McLuhan, Charles Moore and Chad Floyd demonstrated that interactive TV, mixed with the use of the telephone, could recreate the town meeting in the modern city. The television becomes the television set becomes the campfire around which the, the community as village sits and can make decisions. Adding the missing dimension known as inclusivity to urban planning, it was the first and last time that television was used for community design, and its disappearance raises some questions. Would it make sense today to go back to live television for participatory design? Must the architect's physical presence, the act of humanizing the expert, be reinstated to encourage citizen participation through new media formats? Thanks, uh, Masha and Anna. So I think in this case, it's, uh, let's see if we find, I mean, the two videos are also quite different in, in their approach or the, the views they have on democracy on screen. Um, someone would like to start, Asli, uh, Vanessa or Davide? Can just start. I mean, of course, now if we watch these um, more historical documents, it looks kind of uh, it is fascinating how much belief in television was that you could kind of participate and and as could call in and define or decide. But today, with internet, which has been taking a bit over the television's presence, or television is mostly an entertainment device, perhaps that is that is very different. I mean, it's. It's, it looks kind of almost primitive. I can I imagine that you can decide or you can um, talk about the city like that. What I like a lot in the second uh, film, I, I kept on writing quotes like this, um, the TV be becoming the campfire around which people gather to discuss or to decide about the, about the village, which was apparently very much true. And also this belief again, that this place could be a participatory stage or, or motivation for participatory design uh, by Jane Jacobs or, or Anne Lefebvre. This is something which today is perhaps a bit less imaginable that, that you have this kind of belief in it because they're very strong names who have advocated very strong views. And then somehow this simple, in a way, simple medium of TV was introduced to, um, to as, as a tool to reach this participatory design. Um, Thank you for that kind of, uh, let's say, look into the history of this 
issue. That is not a new issue, this participatory design um, tools, let's say, how we would do that. With the first film, I um, I still think that there is a, yeah, there, there are many nuances which might be made or which have to be made. Of course, if we speak about propaganda and if you take this very um, clearly like black and white, very um, hostile, let's say, uh, post uh, to countries in this kind of, um, yeah, in this uh, broadcasting, um, that is also, that has many colors. We, we you show again like news uh, clips or, or um, kind of speeches to the nation and with, with a very clear um, ideological agenda and also very clear idea of calling the other one the bad. And I have sometimes a little bit issues with this kind of black and whiteishness of, of um, you know, of, of this, yeah, of, of material, let's say. I mean, it's, um, it's also faster to consume. And I think maybe the, the format of three minutes is short for that in order to go deeper into the, into the aspects of such, a, um, such a TV appearances. Yeah, because then you have to actually go to the news to, or to watch documentaries and, and see what, um, what is behind it. I mean, it's not, it's not only visual or we can, it's very difficult to just capture writing the visual items, the visual material on this and try to make um, sense or a certain story around it. So in that sense, it's a very difficult job. So I have to congratulate you that you, you took that job on you. But of course, it also brings along its vulnerabilities, I think. So, um, but I think we also talked about it in the mid review. So I should better give the word to the others. So. Um. Yeah, if I can jump in, I was very interested again in this notion of uh, the civic space around television in both, uh, you know, how somehow the television is a crucial immaterial component of, uh, let's say, of the of the material culture of the Cold War, um, uh, bridging uh, uh, speeches and, 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 and events and uh, the idea of uh, of the town meeting. Um, and again, I will just evoke, I think this, this, this films, they really affect my, my own affective memory, but I won't forget in, on 9-11, I was inside the, the University of Sao Paulo, the School of Architecture. I don't know if you know the building, but it's a very, it's kind of an Agora-like building, which has a very prominent um, ramps, uh, sets of ramps. And I was inside the library, which is a glass box. And I was just, uh, uh, well, reading and I saw a, a student pushing a television up upwards uh, to the to the studio level, and this is when actually we saw live, uh, you know, what happened on 9/11 uh, as a kind of a shared experience, and it was very a strong image that I still have on the television moving around because somehow in Brazil at that point we didn't have well internet was not available uh, well at least in our smartphone, so this this notion of you know gathering around the television to have access to you know something that is is big and civic. I think, as uh, we mentioned before, you know, this kind of individual experience of the smartphone. I think that moment was uh, was very very big, and I also like to think of uh, well the the kind of global uh, the global village, but also how television somehow there is a techno political uh, component, but also a cultural, uh, very cultural, strong uh, component to TV, which uh, makes of it a kind of a shared experience that I would say the internet doesn't have. So I'm not sure if you had thoughts about that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I didn't address this uh, as a culture aspect. Uh, I more tried to reveal the same pattern that happened in the Cold War that happens now. Uh, and also like uh, to, to find the same, uh, let's say, um, strategy for um, all these aspects, like uh, how to make the people against each other, how to make propaganda. So, but it's, I think it's very interesting because yeah, through TV, you even by picture, like by background, by, by, by people, you can understand immediately what the, what the context. And yeah, it, maybe we are losing this in the internet. Uh, yeah, I, I like this idea. I like this. Also. There is a cultural filter, I would say, and even the way, I, I mean, as I say, the way, you know, this kind of town meeting event that I myself experienced uh, with 9-11, I'm sure, that others can, uh, you know, uh, speak of the same event uh, through a different uh, TV uh, episode because this is how most of uh, of us, I think, experience that. But to me, I think it's a yeah, it's a very interesting idea to reflect mm. on. 
there is um we had a little bit of a chat about uh, media the concept of media event so that's um i, I think uh, we could say 9 11 is definitely a media uh, an unplanned or unexpected media event and then there are others that are much more um you know like the coronation the first time coronation is um is televised and so these the and, and the, the walking on the moon and all these things where as you say it's really a, a moment that people remember and remember being uh gathering in front of the television so spatially there's a really imp interesting aspect there of course yeah yeah they're really milestones i would say that were filtered or yeah. mediated by tv and i i find it uh, both films somehow uh, tackled those uh, issues uh, in their own ways but i i, I thought it was very interesting and 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 probably i would say 911 was the last big media event because yeah. after that we started having smartphones and um yep yeah, I, I don't know if this is correct but somehow uh, this uh, idea of the media event also reminds me of what habermas was writing about the the way in which for example during the middle age the banners of the of the royals would articulate a public sphere, no? So that the public sphere is in the banner, and the fact that the banner is visible automatically makes that moment a public moment because um, through the banner you show what matters, and the TV show what matters. So what's public is actually what matters. I think there's a somehow probably it's a very banal what I'm saying, but this was just coming to my mind when I was listening to you. But I, I was very also much interested about uh, the, I mean from the, the second. Um, movie I, I didn't know anything about this designathon which i find extremely uh, interesting it, it it's almost obvious that it failed it got obsolete also as a as a as a let's say as a strategy or as a as a show i, I was one question that i would this time ask was uh, what was the agency of this did, did this show produce any actual change in the space of the cities which were uh, addressed during this conversation long distance conversations between experts and and the public, I think, uh, just just to know, because I have no idea, I didn't know anything. But one thing that I um, actually uh, thought, think it's kind of, again, maybe banal, but important to stress is the fact that, of course, a television as a technology allows this mediation. So it is the tool that allows the, the contact and the conversation between different actors. But I was, uh, I was finding very interesting the fact that uh, uh, the way in which the experts would materialize these conversations was a very traditional way and actually not simply traditional i mean sketches and models but something that would be understandable by non-experts no so it, it, part of the conversation necessarily is the materialization the representation again uh, technique uh, and so you would have this moment in which the, the avant-garde technology has to be mediated by a content which is not avant-garde at all because you need to, to discuss and uh, have this uh, possibility to make you uh, be understood. And this reminded me of some examples I recently uh, saw of participated design in which Minecraft was used, for example. So you have these um, uh, architects that would go with tablets with Minecraft installed, they would give Minecraft to, for example, not, not necessarily children, but uh, let's say non designers, but Minecraft allows the possibility allows to even non experts to design something that looks like a a uh, specific kind of public space, for example, a square, if I remember correctly. And there will be the opportunity or the possibility to have a conversation about design with a design done directly by the, uh, by the, uh, by, by the people who were involved. Uh, in this case, there's a sort of uh, apparently less mediation, but of course there's the mediation that uh, Minecraft only allows you to design certain kind of things. But uh, somehow maybe a probably contemporary version of what we saw would be this uh, Video games, no. Uh, instead of uh, television, will be these sort of very accessible, easy to use apps or video games. Anna, do you want to? Um, yeah, answer? maybe right. yeah, to answer to your question, David. Yeah, apparently, Designathon was quite su successful during the ten years that uh, that it happened, and the uh, citizen participation not only happened in the TV set, but they combined this relation between telephone, TV set, and also physical citizen participation. So first people knew that this was happening thanks to the TV. And then in the second phase of the experiment, the architects were physically to the main square of the towns and so on. Uh, and yes, and again, the disappearances, uh, as I mentioned in the video essay, 
due to the deregulation and to the relation of these TV programs to the local channels. Um, if I may add something, there's also, of course, a very, again, like probably banal aspect. Uh, I, will, I will tell it, uh, but um, of course, there's this, there was this idea of appearing in the television. I mean, whether it was your face or it was your opinion, then appearing, making it up to television was something, of course, quite different than now, where you can always put yourself on a kind of broader uh, public, which is interested or by coincidence uh, tunes in or however. What we even do now, I mean, people can watch it, but it's not about only watching, it's also this kind of identity, which, uh, which, which was certain pride and also sharing indeed something public and having made it to the television. Even in some kind of talk shows, you would be on the list and you would be there invited or called at a certain moment to the audience, not even as a guest. So I think there's also this very um, the symbol of something being in television decided or some cities even being discussed is of course a quite a um, big conviction. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting symbol, symbol for what, what it was seen because it also radiated some kind of importance, right? Relevance, importance, it's serious people who made it to the television back then, I guess, um, and less serious, less serious people more in the format of a comedy. But um, all these things of course play a role um, also, I think in in the in how television was uh, operating or how it was used, also using this kind of very human idea of pride, and and sharing the thought on that very uh, public tool, let's say. Um, also, what going, is the? Uh, oh, sorry, Solomon. I know. Um, I'm just thinking about this design at I think one of the things in media events, one of the things that I don't think was really discussed was the cities within which the designathon took place, Roanoke, um, Dayton, Ohio, uh, what was it, Watkins Glen, New York. I mean, basically uh, places in the middle of nowhere. And I mean, as a Midwesterner, I can say that too. So, I mean, I think it's also about what is then the agency or what was the opportunity that was brought by television to these kinds of peripheries and the kinds of accessibility um, uh, that could be there. I don't know, I think it's just something interesting to think about. And then what is the, um, I mean, and then on a kind of digression, I do think that it's interesting, the um, issue of these medieval banners, because those are forms of media that basically are then inscribed in space. So for me, this use of, I, I'm still searching always for the question of how does television inscribe itself or any kind of media inscribe itself in space because then it becomes a kind of spatial and architectural uh, question, right? So, um, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I think, think Solomon, just... that, that's uh, the, the, the center periphery uh, aspect is quite interesting because it's not always that television um, you know, favors the center over the periphery. And uh, another example that I'm, one of the things that I'm researching in regards to MTV is this idea that MTV was first distributed rather in the periphery than in the center. So in the suburbs rather than in big city and how it brought a kind of urban, urban culture, urban aspect, music, and what was cool to, um, to the periphery. And how it plays on on this, you know, local, um, yeah, center periphery um, dichotomy. Yeah, I, and one thing that I was thinking is, and I don't know if this works, how this worked in other parts of the world, but you know, there was the division, at least in the U.S., between um, shit. What was it now? Like UHS and was it VHS? Um, where it was basically what would be the the different bandwidths, um, and I'm at. Uh, it's not VHS, it will come back to me later, but basically one had a kind of, one bandwidth would basically project color uh, and another would project black and white. So, I mean, you know, I'm not that old, but I mean, this was still, uh, you know, up until very recently, it was even through almost high school that uh, uh, early nineties, early to mid nineties, let me quantify that, uh, I qualify that, um, you know, it was still a lot of black and white television, you know? So I, I just think 
these kinds of issues too, because I do think then it does become a thing about center and periphery, because in the middle of nowhere, you wouldn't get any kind of, um, you wouldn't get accessibility maybe until cable, until uh, the cable lines came in, right? So yeah. just, this is a slight, this is a digression, but I think it could be interesting maybe for a wrap up conversation at the end to talk about these things, because then it, um, and maybe if you make a note, because then it also talks about the populist condition in the US uh, and who owns the television media now in this landscape, mm -hmm. because I think all those things are still connected, but let's save that for later. Digression. And in, the, in the UK, in the UK, I also talked about <coughs> the students. There is this kind of geography of of, of television or geography of media because B BBC, of course, um, was was centralized. But then when they started to have um, private television, it was uh, distributed and the, and the, and the, the the area that the television were covering created region created new regions that had nothing to do with the geography or the Pennine or the um, so for example the Granada was in in Manchester and it was a, a very um, it created a sort of region of the north that was not dictated by geography but was really dictated by by media coverage so um, that's also a kind of center periphery um, aspect. Uh, UHF VHF that's the the, the division I think I, UHS I VHS yeah VHF VHF U, uh, UHF yeah I think that's the yeah but let's okay. get back to that because I think that's interesting like for example we would get uh, CBC because of this there was enough closeness to Canada mm. uh, that we would still get that um, anyways. Well, let's go. Thanks. Sorry, I shut up. Great. So, should we um, move to the next? I don't know where we are in our time. Someone is keeping an eye on time, or we are only seven minutes. Uh... Good. Okay. So we're moving to uh, populism now. Yes, we're moving yeah. to populism. Uh, I'm Maria. I'm from Greece, and um, this is Milano Due. Um, this video essay refers to uh, to Milano Due, the city that formed the first entrepreneurial success of Silvio Berlusconi, and at the same time gave birth to Italy's um, to the idea of Italy's private television, um, introducing the new social type. Milano 2, Silvio Berlusconi and the new social type. A city within a city. A ghetto for the rich. A new form of life. A concrete and fascinating experience. A proposal worth contemplating. A parallel universe. Milan without drama. Milano 2 is a residential center in the province of Milan. Milano 2 hosted the headquarters of the first Italian private television channel, Tele Milano, a small cable network that started broadcasting in 1974. It later evolved into Canale 5, the first national private TV station and Silvio Berlusconi's stepping stone into the world of media and communication, and later, political empire. It was built as a new utopian city, the first ambitious entrepreneurial project of Silvio Berlusconi. An entrepreneur with architectural ambition, a salesman. The general philosophy of the city's neighborhoods is his. Based upon the idea that the physical landscape of Milan had become cruel, Milano Due was marketed as a residential neighborhood for families of the upper middle class. A pleasant architecture celebrating picturesque banality. A swan lake. A sporting club. A playground. Conifers. 
the counterpoint effect, a business district, administrative decentralization, land allocation, 2,600 apartments, stone contours, a lifestyle laboratory, the new social type, a city that provides a new service for its neighborhoods, cable television, their very own station with newsreels and reports that would reach every living room, a new sense of immediacy. So, ces photos, c'est ensemble pour la terre. Putin, Bush, et toi. Maï, j'étais là. An architecture that needs to be hidden to maximize its political efficiency. The city of number ones. Television as a political and economic censorship. Architecture as propaganda and imagery. A city that gave birth to the idea of Italian private television. Hosting the new social type, introducing the new social type, shaping the new social type. A city from the 17th that is coming back to trend. Nowadays, a piece of paradise just around the corner. The medium has changed, the logic is similar, the purpose remains. Reinventing the new social type. Hi, I'm Jin. Um, so the next video is looking at three countries that have um, these large territories that span multiple time zones and the uh, different ways that they address time zones within their country as well as the broadcasting across them and comparing the three. The Super Bowl was seen by the largest sports audience in the history of television. 65 million people watching the broadcast on two networks. Russia, with 11 time zones broadcasting from Moscow, through Channel 1, United States, with six time zones, broadcasting through three alternating networks, CBS, NBC, and Fox. China, with one time zone, unified around Beijing time, broadcasting through CCTV. Hurra! <laughs> they got 
Fisher being downfield. Now third down and two, and the handoff for the first down. Начальник Академии, генерал-майор Игорь Емельянов. Выпускники Академии. 在关注春晚的同时呢，可以参与春晚独家红包互动，合作伙伴抖音 APP 为您准备的五轮红包互动。The National Football League welcomes you to the Pepsi Super Bowl 54 halftime show. Расцвечивая небо столицы. Витами государственного. Yeah, they're gonna run around or just throw this thing up, try to run out the rest of this clock. And they have done it. Five, 新春快乐！二一，过年了！拜年了！拜年了！ As we welcome you back inside the broadcast booth, Joe and Troy, and you said during the break this game is far from over. History should tell us that that's the case. Yeah, that's... Thank you both. Um... So Davide, I guess you again know a lot about Milano Due. Yeah, of course the um, the great research that was done by Andres Hake for the Biennale has become a reference, basically, for this sort of uh, intertwinement, no, of the space of the television and and, and the space of the city. Um, more or less, all the the, the main. Uh, main themes on the, or the main subjects uh, of that research have been uh, delivered by the short video. Maybe uh, one thing that puts it in, in somehow in contrast with the um, with the second one, uh, which was also present in the, let's say, the the interpretation of the, the phenomenon of Milano Due was uh, the fact that Milano Due was, uh, according at least to the research, was also the moment that the place in which the first targeted audiences were uh, constructed, no? So the, and you really see that the, the main difference, actually I like this, um, this uh, equilibrium, this balance between the two videos, because on the one hand, we are dealing with super small um, groups of people because this channel TV was meant to, first of all, address the people living within a, a neighborhood, basically, of, uh, of Milano. They were all connected within themselves and they were producing the, at the very, in the beginning, at least, of the channels and the shows themselves and there was this idea that according to the time zone you would address a specific uh, uh, target or a specific let's say lifestyle which was also mentioned in the video therefore the kind of programs would change according to the sort of first survey on the different lifestyles of people who would actually live in Milano Due and this was a very interesting part of that research as I remember but also the the loop between the space of the of the monitor and the space of the uh, housing complex which was actually quite interesting because uh, the uh, the starlight, the famous, uh, the VIPs uh, who were um, um, being uh, shown inside of these programs actually lived inside of this, uh, some of them, or the vast majority of them, they were actually made live inside of these housing complexes. So the people who would see them in television would actually stroll around the Milano Due to see them in real life, no? So you really see how this generates a very interesting loop between the, 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 um, the let's say, the the broadcasted and the experience in real life, the fictional, the non-fictional. So that's for sure um, an extremely uh, interesting example. By by far, actually, I also had the chance to go around Milano Due uh, a couple of uh, two or three years ago. It is actually a quite interesting project, also from the point of view of landscaping. I have to say, so you really feel like you're in a completely different. There's a lot of uh, ground being moved. It looks like hills in a, some sort of English countryside, and then these houses. I don't know. It's a very crazy place. 
the uh, best solution for parking in those hills. Those hills are basically parking yeah, if you go. Yeah, yeah. Inside. Precisely. And the broadcasting station, if I'm correct, is underneath the lake uh, or something like that. So it almost gets yeah, this spooky exactly. James Bond uh, somehow feeling at a certain moment, which I enjoy very much. And the, um, on the other hand, the second one, uh, I, I like the fact that somehow these three examples which were shown are, of course, very interesting. But I have the feeling that they belong, and some of them clearly so, to something which really comes from the past, which is this idea of the mass show for, for a nation or for a big community. I mean, if we can, of course, uh, compare the numbers uh, of, the, of the Super Bowl, uh, which today apparently are matched, if not even overcome, but some, maybe sometimes, uh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but by the numbers that like the final uh, game of League of Legends, the League of Legends tournament, uh, uh, which is this uh, multiplayer video game, uh, uh, which apparently has as many uh, people watching the, the finals uh, as the Super Bowl, but of course it's people from all over the world. Um, I think makes uh, us understand a little bit how we are also rearticulating completely these, uh, uh, these areas which are reached by uh, these, these shows. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting to see how also how the geopolitics according to which these video game uh, tournaments move each year from one uh, nation to the other, from one continent to the other, to find the best possible solution between time zone and, uh, and, and the tournament, and also who plays the most of that specific game, uh, which of course is uh, uh, worldwide uh, played and so on. I mean, there's a completely now different uh, uh, geography, which has been designed by online uh, multiplayer games, also the logics according to which uh, he the headquarters of these, um, uh, let's say, uh, teams that play these video games have been moved in order to have each, uh, each time zone one team, and so on and so forth. I mean, uh, for what I see, it's actually quite interesting. How can we re-understand, uh, let's see, really the uh, geography according to this new function, these new programs, and, and this new... Uh, um, softwares uh, and these uh, these new jobs basically, which are being uh, somehow spread around all over the world with, with huge masses of people both playing and, and watching them. I think that could be an interesting actual development of this uh, this research on the Super Bowl. Um, yeah, do you want to answer to that, or can I just jump in? Yeah, yeah, go ahead for some interesting idea. I'll take it through that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the two film, I was very interested in the notion of uh, maximizing political efficiency and, uh, you know, how you move from controlling the masses to the control of urban space of what Andres Haki would say, direct to home TV urbanism. And it made me think of, um, I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with the story, but uh, now, of course, uh, Lina Bobardi came to the foreground of architecture, I would say, in the last decade, but there is a four decade battle between the Teatro Oficina that she designed in Sao Paulo with one of the most populous TV chains in Brazil called SBT. They are really like the, you know, the most, uh, if I may, cheesy TV shows that are in private TV for, uh, I would say, more than five decades, no, more than that even, uh, by a very prominent figure. He's, he's not as equivalent to Berlusconi, but in the way his TV is influential, it lost a lot of influence in the last decades, but it used to be, and they, of course, there is a, a park that would secure the, the future and the light that comes in the, the Teatro Oficina. And Silvio Santos, this TV owner, he wants the three, uh, to build three uh, towers, uh, very, very high rise buildings that would completely kill the, the Teatro Oficina. And what is at stake there, of course, in this debate is the kind of, uh, I would say, the high and low cultural divide that, uh, you know, is the kind of a background for this, because, of course, Teatro Oficina is considered to be an elitistic. Um, I would say venue for you know plays that very few would go and SBT is uh, really one that uh, so I really liked how in both uh, films somehow this idea of uh, the TV also of course this kind of specialization of uh, you know uh, of populism uh, from you know controlling the masses through any material uh, medium to uh, the material space but also how TV can be used to quantify public op opinion and statistics which I think it's something that for many many years was uh, very very strong so I'm not sure if you want to speak about that. Jean, do you want to go ahead? Um, actually, I'm not. Mm. 
because what 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 I would say is important at least for 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 Milano Due is that uh, we're talking about 19 the 1970s right where everybody would uh, would gather to uh, to places together and they would watch television for example uh, in one time. It, the, there wasn't the option that you could just switch it off and rewatch it later. So that's uh, that's I think the interesting thing there that the, the the audience was indeed targeted, and it was site specific and time specific at the same time. Yeah. So um, I think at least while while looking into mine, there was this kind of shift from uh, maybe this type of media event being more about democracy or kind of bringing everything together, um, then eventually I think it turned into something that is more about um, populism. For example, like uh, the, the Spring Gala um, event is in China, they initially didn't have so much advertising. And then more recently, these um, um, internet companies and um, started to, uh, our tech companies started to fund these events and become a method of um, advertising for them. And um, yeah, going back to also what um, Davide was talking about, I think, yeah, since it has shifted from that, like these events remaining kind of more territorial in their kind of um, audience maybe has taken more of this role of becoming a populist event because uh, while trying to decide which topic my, um, or thematic mine was addressing, I had a bit of difficulty. <laughs> but in terms of, uh, if, if we go back to Milano Due in terms of high and low and sort of, um, it's interesting that this Milano Due was created really for a specific uh, part of population, let's say the kind of new rich and, and people that, that were around the uh, media environment. And then that it had its own TV channels. So it was like a TV channel for a specific part of population. Then it extended to the whole, the whole population. But I think, yeah, it's a very interesting case of a spatialization of this high and low, uh, um, bridging high and low and this um, division of society. I mean, I'm just was thinking the, um, you know, how Berlusconi actually made all of his money was he uh, he bought the syndication rights for American uh, television series like Dynasty and Dallas, which were spectacles of themselves and media events um, like, well, for those that don't know, like who killed JR? You know, I very much remember that that was a media event. Even my father sitting there on Friday night at 10 p.m. Uh, to watch that with us in the early, you know, 80s. And I just wonder then how can you kind of bridge these two, uh, uh, two kinds of things, right? Because on, um, uh, uh, well, there, um, yeah, well, the point being that maybe it's not always uh, news, but what is the um, kind of, um, what did that bring into the Italian context? I'm always very curious, uh, you know, sort of probably like the uh, something uh, la, Latin uh, or Mediterranean, like the telenovelas in Latin America, you know, this kind of, you know, and there must be ones in Greece too. But my point being here is how do you, um, um, yeah, I think it's important to, maybe it's not even populism as the thing, but another form of spectacle, I guess is what I'm getting at. Because it's also, I was thinking, um, uh, there are, in what the 1930s at the beginning of Hollywood, there was also all these kinds of, um, I don't even, I don't remember right now what they're called, but these kinds of dancers and spectacles that would be in these big um, uh, Bugsby, whatever his name films, where they would basically do, do calisthenics and all these sorts of things, which, you know, you know that reminds me of the kind of, uh, well, the Super Bowl, the Korean imagery. I mean, so there are these, things that are happening so i don't know if it's um i would just be careful about the word populism i mean this is a word leon i have been trying to define 
for ages. I mean, because maybe it's not populism, but popular within its own um, kind of context is what I'm sort of uh, uh, getting at or within one's time frame. Another thing, because Maria, you brought this up about um, uh, only being able to watch an event once. I mean, I wonder if anybody knows something like direct TV. So this is like the kind of a proto Netflix. I mean, you know, there was a moment where if we wanted to, if you wanted to watch something then you had your VCR and you recorded it, right? And then you got home and then you watched it. Then all of a sudden, you know, after 9-11, just to contextualize that, 2002, 2003, something like that, uh, maybe even a little bit later, actually, there, uh, it, uh, it was um, direct TV. And I just remember we were all like, what the hell? What is this? You have this live TV recording. You're going to fast forward, rewind. Why would you want to do something like this? And this was actually at the same time that Netflix was emerging, where you would where Netflix before it was streaming, it was DVDs. So what you would do is you would have a membership and you would order a whole bunch of DVDs. They would come in the mail and then you would mail them back. So that became the end of, let's say, uh, something like Blockbuster, if you know what this, you know, the video store. So anyways, you know, which is, oh, it has also a spatial implication. Oh, what happened to all that leftover real estate, you know? Um, uh, anyways, but just kind of, footnotes yeah I'm, I'm if I, may i would like to also say some words about the, the 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 films also about how they are made i think um the two last ones we saw uh i think they again both of them they have a very good rhythm which is which is improved since uh, last time i saw them and what i find very good and quite intelligent is with the broadcasting across time that there's hardly any voiceover by the maker. So it is one of the very few students, if not the only one, um, who's not speaking during the movie. So it's a real visual essay with all the, also the, the shouting at the Super Bowl. And so, so it really gets us into the, to, the um, to these programs, which I find really intelligent and it works. Um, it also shows, of course, this kind of yeah, evenness of all these events at the same time. I mean, they're in different time zones, but but the typology of these events, they 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 um, they're also similar to each other. So I found it quite well done, and um, and also covering, of course, more things than just um, propaganda as a, or or populism, as Solomon was pointing out. I think as well here is more the popular events than the populism. I mean, it can lead to it, but it's not, it's not, uh, let's say the ultimate, the result. Um, and by the Milano Due also, it's, uh, yeah, I didn't, I mean, I, I knew about it, but I didn't, I never saw such a kind of fast uh, cut through it. Uh, I was just asking myself again, what would it be today? I mean, if I was going to do it today, what would he build? Would, would he still build a kind of television broadcasting? Or, I mean, it's quite significant as the first private Broadcasting or television, state television in Italy, and then what would it be today? I just wonder because, of course, our discussions, us being today the kind of guests from certain generation where you still remember TV, and I stopped having a TV, I think, in 1999. So I didn't own a TV ever since, but I see it occasionally when I go to my mother's house. And what Solomon was describing, it's crazy what TV has became. But I think the students in students' life, the TV has complete the other, uh, um, yeah, complete the other uh, existence. I mean, I have a lot of nostalgic also memories, like like what Esther was talking about, all certain things which were awakened. I also have to think of uh, you know my uncle turning on the TV for the boxing matches in the states at like three o'clock in the morning, my mother making tea for him and for the father, and they were watching the boxing in the states. I mean kind of, and getting up for that. So it's somehow, it reminds, it's, that's also why it's quite a nice uh, review, I must admit, because it, it brings a lot of memories also into mind, but probably we will have to move to the next group. Otherwise I can just keep on talking about this. JR as well, we also watched, and we also wondered who killed him, especially my grandmother. She was very sad, so.
Let's move to the next one. And uh, indeed, we have time at the end for a more general discussion, so we can come back to these things again. Um, so the last one is continuity. So we also talked about this idea that, you know, television wasn't always 24-7. And then when it becomes 24-7, what does it mean in terms of time and space and architecture? So we have again two videos. Hello. Um, so Turner Classic Movie um, is an American television uh, network that shows 24 hours uh, all classic movies. So when one goes to sleep and can't fall asleep or one wakes up in the middle of the night, it's become kind of the staple in the American household where you can kind of put yourself to sleep or occupy yourself in the bedroom um, when you can't sleep. So it's kind of affecting how television has affected the bedroom and um, how the 24 hour film network channel has affected the bedroom. sleep. help us continue to enjoy these movies as we always have for the next decade, two decades, three decades, for the next hundred years.
Mm. The next is mine. Hi, I'm Ryan. Uh, I'm talking about this uh, attention economy that is discussed in uh, Jonathan Crary books, uh, 24-7. So this uh, design uh, in the world of uh, information is a wealth and the attention becomes a scarcity. For a long time, media companies are trying to capture our attention through banners, signages, and billboards in the public space, while our home was a sanctuary from advertising and commerce. However, since the 20th century, television comes to our living room and expose our private space. With its primetime channel, the TV constructs a new ritual inside our home, which is to sit and watch the television for hours. The cathode ray tube was an instance where glare and gossip of the public world penetrated the most private space and contaminated the quiet and solitude of the individual space. But mass synchronization of information production on television is outdated. Time is far too valuable not to be leveraged with plural sources of solicitation and choices that maximize possibilities of monetization and allow the continuous accumulation of information about the user. Corporate success would measure in the number of eyeballs they could consistently engage in control, just as the TV filled our 24-7 world with the televisual in which the aim is states of neutralization and inactivation where one oblivious of time. A French sociologist, Dominique Boulier, describes four envelope environments that inform our attention regimes. Immersion, projection, loyalty, and alert regime. These envelopes always mixed and overlap in different proportions. To experience immersion, we need the lowest degree of immunity and let our attention to had or caught. It has the ability to produce a bubble of complete cosmos that capture every sense. On the other hand, projection avoiding any influence or any feedback from environments and even making the environments bent our goal, allowing us to apply our own rules or law into the territory of our attention. Loyalty is the most common way to maintain the attention that has been captured previously. Through repetition, it allows attention to turn into a habit. TV programs and TV series are experts in producing this fidelity by designing a protected environment that maintains habits and prevents other brands' invasion to our attention. Take the phone off the hook and the plastic off the couch. That's right, it's the Pleasantville Marathon. 24 hours chocked full of pure family value. Finally, alertness is opposed to loyalty, where our attention keeps being grabbed by newness and surprise, putting us in a position of uncertainty leading to stress and discontinuity. Our attention is constantly bombarded with alerts and notification to break our habit from previous attachment. In the alert regime, we are encouraged to constantly engage with our devices. Doing nothing or stopping to eat and sleep is a waste of time and productivity in the era of the attention economy. Without realizing it, our most private space is now the most vulnerable area where the attention merchant constantly steals our attention and consumes our time as much as possible with ads, noise, and distraction. What will be left in our physical space when most of our attention is placed in the virtual environment? How can the envelope of our domestic space prevent the constant invasion of the attention merchant? Thank you for those last two um, video uh, essay. Uh, 
someone would like to start, comment. Asli, maybe if you don't know if you also have something to say in, in regards to the yeah the video so how they were made or how they how they developed develop yeah how they were made and how they developed from last time because they also changed a lot I would say from last time yes they did uh, um, both of them well. Uh, the 24 hours sleep and also this introduction of continuity is, of course, is very specific about this issue of the sleep and it's, it's, it focuses also in the space of the sleep. Very also, I mean, confronting us with very small spaces, almost like with the bed and this glowing screen. Um, and somehow it's, uh, it makes it, it, it meanwhile, uh, it makes it much more direct than it, it did. I think last time it was a bit more, uh, say, um, uh yeah scattered at the same time i have to admit that i had that kind of the difficulty to concentrate on what the question thereby could be i mean because i think there was also this idea of asking always a question or finishing grounding up with the question i'm not so sure if if i could with this structure of the of the first film if i could kind of follow to um and come to, to a certain inquiry or question i think that that is a certain critique I, I would give. Um, whereby by the second one is of course also this, uh, yeah, the, 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 again, this um, contradiction between the loyalty and alerts that I think works pretty well in order to make the bridge to the endlessness of today, not even continuity, that how you're busy with, um, with the with the screen in the hand and it never stops and what will be the spatial as a spatial outcome for that which is of course a very actual question i think the interesting part is in this kind of continuity uh, analyzing it via the television and that's somehow connecting it to today because um we all wonder what is this going to be at the same time well it, it keeps on happening that we have physical spaces and we have to move through them so, I mean, I just wonder if these questions can be formulated a little bit more specific or without op leaving them so open, because there is also a kind of opinion you can bring in. There is still physical space. And I don't think that will so quickly disappear. So in that sense, the question is here also again, quite open. Um, but I think the bridge made towards the, the yeah, continuity of a screen is more here at stake than the continuity of the television. It's, it's a kind of introductory remark at the, in the last film I found. Um, that is how I see them having developed in the last three weeks, uh, especially the second one more structured, I would say. Um, do, they, do you wanna answer or shall I just jump in? Let's go on. I think you can go, Vanessa. Yeah. Okay. Well, the first film made me, of course, uh, I, I assume that this could have been a reference of Beatrice Colomina's analysis of the bed. I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, with it, uh, well, she she would talk about uh, you know from um, um, John Lennon and Yoko Ono being in bed. You know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know this event. Uh, you know, since their marriage would be broadcast anyway, so they just remain in bed, and uh, and this is how they actually convey their message of peace to how the bed you know metamorphoses and becomes uh, uh, all sorts of architectural spaces. And I also, it also made me think um, in the kind of subjectification, if I can say, of the TV. And uh, I wonder if this is an important dimension to you, because I would say that many people would, and I think it has to do also with the physical presence of TV in, you know, its kind of previous editions. I mean, it, it's becoming more and more material, but how TV somehow keeps one company and how I would say that also this continuity, some people would just leave TV on to kind of keep them company. So. I, I wonder if you could uh, speak on that dimension. Yeah, I think it's it's a way to feel like you're not alone, um, but it also is a, it's like these, I think these movies 
especially the older ones, um, really can transport you um, kind of into anywhere. So if you, if you are alone, for example, and you're watching this kind of romantic old um, movie with maybe Audrey Hepburn, there's something that you kind of reminisce about um, and you feel like you're kind of a part of it, um, even though you're you're actually not. And um, or you know you can go anywhere to Egypt, um, and it's kind of this like realization fantasy. So it's kind of this way to um, make sure that you're kind of when you're not really where you are, right? It's a way to distract yourself from the space or the the issue that you're having of not being able to fall asleep. So it's this kind of this distraction or this idea that maybe I'm, I don't have to be alone per se, but I technically am. Yeah, but the, in the economy, in the attention economy, I would say it also deals with the unexpected content, right? And it makes me again think of, as I said, my son, because I don't, we don't have a TV. So any, my husband is half Italian. So anytime we go there and he doesn't understand how Rai Yo Yo works for him, it really, he can, you know, there should be some sort of agency. He says, I don't want to watch this anymore. How can I, you know, jump to something else? And I would say the TV as, he, you know, as it is where there is no agency, of course, it has to do with this kind of unexpected content. And sometimes in the past, uh, even if, uh, you know, if you're not interested, you would still leave TV on and, and, and somehow there is a presence that was part of one's everyday life. I wouldn't say even during the daytime, it's not only, I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure why you decided to focus on the nighttime because I remember again, affective memories, but how TV was turned on the whole day in my grandparents' house, for example. And this daytime dimension to where you didn't consider it for your film, why the nighttime would be uh, more appropriate for you to tackle the questions that you, you were willing to. Um, I think for, for the nighttime, it, it gets interesting in the sense, so this, this channel is really continuous. So you know exactly what you're expecting. And there's something really, um, it's, it's reliable and it's comforting, right? So when, you're, when you can't fall asleep or you, you, you're up in the middle of the night and you're kind of sitting there thinking, what am I to do? And I, I need to do something. It's this kind of like neutral, comforting, mellow TV program. Um, and I think this is, I think the nighttime, there's so much activity during the day and there can be activity during the night as well, right? I mean, if you're a doctor per se, you're not on an average schedule and your nighttime is your daytime. So it's this, it's this idea of continuity and especially at nighttime when it's, you know, three o'clock in the morning when the rest of the world is mostly asleep in your time zone is asleep but you're not for whatever reason and television this ch this channel is there it is it's the one that's awake thank you well, I, I like the to... oh <laughs> go ahead Sorry. no I was just thinking that I think with the Turner classic movies I think one thing that you haven't really fully talked about was maybe the actual uh, medium of those films because there is certain techniques, there is slowness of narrative. There is, I mean, there's something that is, um, I mean, you allude to it, but you're never full on concrete about it. There is something about movie making within a certain period, which I can understand the kind of soothingness. So maybe that, uh, more of an investigation into that and those uh, storylines or storyboards or scenographies could have been a way to tie things together a little bit more. I mean, one thing that I keep that I kept thinking when you were talking about the bedroom was not just um, the allusion to Cole Amina's uh, work on the bed, but also really what was the original bedroom? In many ways, we're going back to that. We're not at, you know, the bedroom, you know, it had the whole family was sleeping together in the bed. Everything was happening in one large room. You know, uh, Louis the 14th, everything was happening uh, in the bed chamber. There was security, teapots, everything, you know. So in this sense, maybe we're going towards a kind, you know, we're going back to a kind of, um, yeah, origin or something of the bedroom. I mean, one could start to conceptualize that maybe as a set of spatial ideas 
that we sort of come full circle. I mean, that could have also been a way to maybe um, uh, 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 throw that out there to talk about our new, um, yeah, to tie that together, maybe to bookend that in the narrative. Sorry, uh, Leah? No, I was just gonna say one thing that I, I liked in the way you did this film, and although I think technically they were good, you know, we talked about this already, but transitions and stuff, but I like this idea of having a, a still image and then the, the film, so the kind of old film is actually what is moving and then the image is fixed. Um, and I thought that just as a, as a technique of doing this, this video was, was, uh, was a good idea or was interesting, was an interesting idea. Um, so the, 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 the old film be becoming alive in a way, whilst the, what is supposed to be now is, is kind of frozen, frozen in time. So I like that. And I think it also speaks of this subjectification. I mean, the object becomes the kind of real life and the TV is alive. I, mm. I perhaps thought that the text could be, you could have explored that in like a, a fully, instead of yeah. having, um, I think it compromises a little bit the impact of that uh, montage. Yeah, and the object is alive is also a bit the idea that when you say it's the TV that puts you to sleep, you know, it's kind of almost someone who's, coming to your bed and I don't know how you say that in English, like singing you a song or something, but uh, yeah. So, but it's true that it could have been said more. Yeah. David, uh, did, uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Who? Me? I, I'm not sure, but okay. I felt like you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, yeah, indeed. But if someone else has a comment, please, I, I, I'm not. No, it's just it. something technical I wanted to say about the, the making of the film. So please, David, I go out because I think con okay. content is more interesting. All right. <laughs> no, but I mean, um, many things have already been said. But one thing that I really enjoyed of these last uh, two videos is that there's two topics which maybe are, have been made even more evident uh, at, at the end of this uh, afternoon. First of all, is the, um, the way in which this screen with content that we call television, that in the end could be a smartphone, could be a TV, could be a computer, whatever, it really generates and produces uh, effects on uh, not only the, let's say, there's not simply a transmission of ideology, which is how we have more or less uh, uh, approached the, the, the topic today, but it's also um, it also influences the body, no? So there are um, consequences uh, uh, on, for example, I, I was interested in the fact that the, the more you watch television, the less, uh, in order to go to sleep, the less you can actually sleep because the television conditions you not to, <laughs> to sleep in a way. This is a very, uh, we, we all know this, but as a matter of fact, uh, the bodies are affected by monitors, by, by, con uh, by, by video games again. And sorry if I always bring forward what I know, but um, I remember watching this uh, documentary about these teams of people playing these uh, very famous uh, worldwide video games and they are all super successful uh, teenagers with uh, huge bank accounts and their bodies are all, like white and super super skinny and uh, clear with the super red eyes because the monitors are basically killing them, no? Uh, something like that. So somehow also to, 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 to see this relationship between the, the, the computer, the monitor and us was something which was coming to the fore here, which I think is also interesting. Indeed, the screen's position as in space, uh, this was also coming to the fore in this final um, part of the day, which is uh, not simply, again, assuming certain knowledge, but really moving in space in a, in a, in a certain way. And, and there's also the, this other topic, which I think we did somehow discuss uh, during my uh, time capsule a couple of months ago, which is, if we may use this uh, terribly abused the word, the, the resilience of domestic furniture to the technological changes. So when uh, Solomon is speaking of the fact that we are going back to some sort of a pre-industrial uh, 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 way of using the bedroom, but in the end, the bed is always the bed and we still have, are witnessing all these changes in how we use the bed. So uh, there's always this interesting um, Delta, this difference between the, the use of the house and the, and the appearance of the house, which reminds me of Ugo La Pietra's exhibitions uh, on the, the future house, which never happens, but we still think as it will happen next week. So all these three topics, no? So how we are positioned in space, how our body is affected and how does actually space, the domestic space change as a, or doesn't change as a consequence of uh, uh, technologies and TV, I think is still uh, all question marks that we can, uh, uh, put at the end of the conversation and keep uh, questioning and, and wondering about. 
Yeah, if yeah, I may. I just, I'll go. I, I just want to know, did you guys read um, Jonathan Crary's book, 24-7, um, the essay, or, uh, uh, to help to conceptualize this? Because I still think that there are some parts there that could be, um, could help you tie things uh, uh, together a bit in reaction to uh, some of these comments, sorry. Yeah, I was also going to ask, I mean, I think it's very interesting this uh, biological cycle versus, you know, the cycle of the, you know, the machine and the, the, the content. Uh, and I was wondering if you also read Paul Virilio on the screen, if this was a reference for you and the way, you know, he talks about how the screen somehow conveys a lost dimension of space or the acceleration of visualization, a virtual surface, even the TGV, the screen. Of, so it's not really about the television, but I think his approach to this kind of biological take on the screen and how it changed our uh, perception of the world. Uh, it's very interesting. And I, somehow both films uh, uh, yeah, made me uh, think of it. So if it's not a reference, I would say that I would encourage you to um, yeah, read it. Thank you. For I mean, that. Yeah, and another just um, uh, uh, yeah, like idea to give along for the twenty-four hour sleep movie. Uh, it has many facets, so you can actually you can actually talk about, about a lot of things taking this movie. But technically, I think it's a bit like a like a panel presentation. You know, you have to make a focus, and then you you create the rhythm where there's something occurring, which which is the central question. And um, when the film begins, we are with this uh, with this yeah, Tur Turner movie, twenty four hour um, uh, channel. So we are introduced to it, but perhaps is that part a bit too long or to to elaborate? But then um, we've seen several interiors where the little trick started to happen. This at the corner was a TV, and in that TV something was happening. Maybe not even um, yeah, it was like a photoshopped uh, uh, animated uh, image. And towards the end, of course, we kept those seeing the same image. So it was the bedroom, the little bed, and then the screen. And that's this, and with this very heavy music in between. What I want to say is that actually, it's not far from the architect's metier, how you make this kind of movie. It's, it's, it turns around the same, um, same question of how you, how you put the attention on the core of a project or on the core of a topic. And I think in the making of this, of the 24 hour sleep, that might have maybe um, be a bit more monotonous or somehow at a certain moment, not anymore. Yeah, changing space so that you watch the same space of the bed, you watch the screen and uh, yeah, that, that made it a little bit like, you know, um, crumbling somehow what the question might be. It's just to give along as a you know, very, uh, let's say humble advice <laughs> to, to uh, always think of the composition of the film and also where you create this moments of um, of tension or release uh, bringing to a question. Um, it's just a methodical thing. Not that I ever make movies that often, but it's just, uh, I'm just watching it today, I had to say it, so. Thank you, um, thank you all. Um, so we have, uh, we have 15 minutes left if we want to discuss um, more in general the, the class, the different topic, the, the videos that were produced. Um, and also I invite you guys to maybe start the discussion if you want. I don't know, maybe so, like what strike you more from the class or what, what you think is most useful or will remain with you or was uh, surprising or... I can start with a kind of banal question, also very topic, uh, but I would say, I would ask, I think it's a kind of an obvious question, but um, how did the whole situation that we're living in affected your, uh, you know, interpretation? Of course, you haven't taken this class last year, so you can't really address that, but how somehow it, it, it has played in, in the production or, you know, readings, um, do you think, um, it affected, I'm sure it did, but in what ways? I think maybe if I can speak for all of us, we started studying this program in September. So we really went into this program already knowing that, uh, well, we were already used to 
this uh, this uh, um, well COVID uh, world in that sense. So uh, uh, yeah, meetings did always take place. Well, uh, yeah, often took place in front of the camera. So reading all this literature and all these references about how people behave differently when they are on screen or when they know that there's a camera pointed at them, uh, it's very um, uh, confronting, let's say, right? You know exactly what you're uh, reading about because what you're reading about is yourself. Um, so maybe that's one of the first most obvious things to, to put, up, put out there. Uh, but secondly, to me then, um, it's funny to see how, how, well, relatively old this literature sometimes is, right? We're talking about uh, a legacy medium, television, which, well, the, the, the term obsolescence came by. So um, uh, it's not necessarily something that we uh, um, engage with that much these days anymore. Um, but still, it's all quite relevant. Um, yeah, um, I think that's uh, that's mostly it for, for me right now uh, uh, to respond to your question. Uh, but don't you think that there, sorry, can you just clarify that we don't use the word obsolescence? Did I understand that correctly nowadays? No, 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 that, that um, I, the word obsolescence is being used um, as a theme to look at the television, right? Yeah, yeah. So that the, the, let's say the position of the television in our current daily lives is not as uh, of that importance as it was, I don't know, maybe 40, 30 years ago to just... Uh, Sure. Yeah, but just, but just to frame. play devil's advocate, though, mm -hmm. you know, you're also coming from uh, with your uh, parenthetical pause in the art world, in the art school. I mean, I also see, uh, but it's also very hipster to engage with the television as exhibition objects, as these things to kind of find old televisions in uh, tag sales and reconnect them. So in that sense, um, uh, like many other things, I would just argue that there will be a revival of the television. And I mean, you know, the thick, the thick box as the object, you know, I can imagine this happening just like how there's a revival of everything nowadays, just to play devil's advocate. No, for sure. Never, I think, you know, I, think I even, I think I even once found a, like a spe specialized uh, uh, equipment rental uh, store specializing in these square Sony box, Foxy TVs, which are perfect geometrical cubes. Um, but then it's, a, it's, a, it's an ultra, let's say a specific way of looking at this medium, right? Or but it's, it's, a, a, it's a revival of the object as opposed to the technology, right? There's two different things. And I, I was, I mean, last year, the, also to come back to what Vanessa was saying. So this year we did everything online. Last year I did a few sessions face-to-face -face and then it went online. And last year I had planned to do an exhibition at the end of the course. And I was kind of dreaming. I had this idea that students would go and get old TV and then have their video played in those old TV. And I mean, it never happened, but, but that, was a, that is a kind of nostalgia for, for the object and for the um, aesthetic of TV, as opposed to, um, I think what has changed really is the technology and the infrastructure that this is definitely gone as, uh, as Joaquim Moreno says in its uh, little clip that you that you took TV is gone or what did you say? Yeah, but it's of you course just... quite uh, ex uh, expectable that this kind of nostalgia creates a fetish of the object. I mean, LP was quite the same. The first digital um, uh, album you could buy, I think, was Radiohead, and you could just choose what to pay, and then you got uh, if you bought the LP, you got the code of the digital. Um, album. So, I mean, it's like, of course, the LP was also became much more expensive than what it was. So, um, obviously, all these these machines would come. And actually, there, Katrin, it's interesting. You remind me to this idea of exhibition. But then I would almost also like, um, uh, as an exhibition uh, designer, very often, I would almost accuse you of being, being kind of too nostalgic and too fetishistic about the object if you would have had an exhibition showing everything in an old uh, old um, television object, you know, because somehow indeed there is this nostalgic idea about it or some fetish, which comes back. It's like retro in a way. And then as Salomon said, it will be probably uh, coming along. Um, 
but what it did content wise and how kind of tv changed the lives and also the the domestic life even the the like let's say political space uh, that is i think what this course is being busy with sometimes maybe a little bit um uh, drifting away from what one would call architecture but that does not necessarily um that does not necessarily matter you know i mean there are a lot of films today i see it again like third time i see uh, this this kind of work tutored by Katrin. I I think there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of surfaces which touch architecture, and it's a way of watching architecture through the television or the space through the television. In that sense, I think it's a uh, it must be a fun studio somehow. I mean, I guess we kind of had fun no? despite reading and everything, and I you hope. have to do, but. <laughs> You have seminar. Have it's a seminar. Yeah, it's a seminar. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's a seminar. Bear with me. A pro seminar. Yeah. yeah. A pro seminar. Pro seminar, even. Okay. Yeah. But do you think no, that. But in sorry, in relation to this fetish of the object and this kind of, uh, you know, how the TV became this kind of vi vintage, um, you know, approach to, to well, as a, as a device, do you think that there could be a, a chance that TV's uh, nostalgia would also kind of refer to this shared collective experience after, you know, this two years. Uh, I am just thinking of the LP, for example, vinyl, how, you know, somehow vinyl became uh, also something that uh, reappeared in domestic uh, spaces and people would just gather around it, uh, you know, it's vintage, if you will, but the kind of, uh, um, as a shared collective experience, rather than putting your headphone, I mean, do you think the TV could possibly make its reappearance um, in this sense as a shared um, collective moment that we didn't have for all these two years? That's a question for you. Well, I oh, think. Yeah. yeah, well, I think in certain cases, like today even like for example sports or some events like um the eurovision or something like that people always tend to gather and watch together right so it really depends on the content i would say um where the view the sh uh, the thing you're watching actually demands a greater audience so i have that a question topic. because all of you are coming from very vastly different parts of the world so how does context deal with this i mean to, yeah, grandparents, if not your immediate family. I mean, I don't want to make uh, uh, judgments here, but I'm very curious to this. I mean, I can imagine that a lot of people still have televisions at home, grandparents and things like this, or am I like delusional in thinking this? Actually, we really had uh, good conversations in the beginning of the seminar when yeah. we were all amidst ourselves discussing what kind of TV guides they had or what kind of shows we grew up watching. So there was definitely this cultural difference. And speaking for myself, I would say that uh, in India, at least, there are still television sets in every household, but it's mostly just one as a home theater or just in the living room. But otherwise, the people just watch, um, at least the younger generations completely rely on laptops. <laughs> but there's still like very um, um, prevalent, um, I would say, an architect's drawing because um, every time we try to uh, state that this is a living room, we'll put the TV and this, a, a couch set there. So yeah, I think at least in, in Taiwan, we, we, we still uh, conceive a living room or like a communal space in, in, the, um, in the households look like that. And how, how, how the, the image of, uh, of uh, your daily life uh, branch out from, from that point. In Greece, it, it, it's the same. The TV may have, may have become flatter and flatter, but they're still there and maybe even sometimes used uh, as a screen to connect your computer because it's the bigger one, but still. And for myself, I think growing up, we did have a family TV, but then we, instead of the TVs, like uh, introducing a TV to the, like our individual bedrooms, it was actually the computer that was, we just made the step um, past that and just did the computer into the room and then but it's interesting, like uh, for, I see my friends, um, 
move to, to their new place to give it a sense of home in a empty room. Yeah, first thing it's usually got like bought is a TV and a couch. And mm. um, that's these objects are just yeah, create a sense of home and like uh, in our generation that I think uh, has moved, moving out. It's, uh, but also I think it's the, it's the device which changed. I mean, the design of it changed as it was said before, um, it was domesticated with a wooden box like the radio was. It became part of the domestic furniture uh, equipment. And um, in Turkey, again, like, you know, the, the people would um, like my grandmother and so on, they would, um, they would just, uh, yeah, um, kind of, you know, add some, uh, some little tissue on top. You know, like really, and when it was turned on, then they put it off. I mean, it's completely, you know, they decorated the TV, the object. What is happening today is, of course, that this technological aspect is coming back. And the TV as a furniture is, they're, they're growing and growing. They are huge. So, you know, they're just gigantic screens. At the same time, the object itself is almost disappearing. There's hardly a frame anymore. There's not a thickness anymore. So you, you, might, you might buy it, you might have a set, but it is again back to this technology, technology aesthetic, uh, which was so beautifully packed into the wooden box <laughs> because it was too much, let's say, or it was too too strange. But today is actually this kind of high tech element, which I mean, the couch is how high tech can a couch or sofa be? But the television completely went again to this idea of the screen, which is perfect and which is technologically optimized and thinner and thinner almost disappearing. And that is quite interesting, I think, in the interiors or architecture surrounding what these screens do. Because I, from my own account, I mean, I hate the thing because if you don't watch it, it's there. You can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like a projection. It's always there. And I don't like that device to see if it's not performing. And then meanwhile, other things perform instead of TV. But I think it's this object quality again, to which I keep on coming back. Um, is a gate that also shifted and it's not, uh, yeah, it, it radiates the kind of technology and not the furniture, um, you know, integration aspects. It's more like showing that it's really high, high tech device. And that is different than from before, I think a little bit. But I, 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 I believe that this conveys a much more immersive experience. It becomes really this uh, virtual surface, I would say that Paul Virilio talks about. It's almost like an environmental, um, device much more than an object itself. I think I'm always, I don't have a TV, but every time I go to a store where TVs are, uh, are sold, I'm always fascinated by the quality of the image, something that I don't have at home, but like, I just imagine that, uh, yeah, having it at home is, uh, is a much more immersive experience than the old big um, monsters. <laughs> Yeah, and now you have TVs, like flat screen with some incredible sound system. You know, the sound is not necessarily in the TV. So it's yeah. uh, some people buy incredible sound system and then it becomes really an immersive um, experience. The newest, the newest um, part uh, are also curvy now, right? They, they make yeah. half, half of a circle. Yeah. There is also this new thing of, um, or new, I don't know, of TV that becomes like a, a frame when you're not watching it. That's for you, Asli. <laughs> like it transformed in some sort of cheesy, uh, uh, you know, scene with a bird and uh, some, so it's a kind of a frame TV. Yeah, yeah but uh, you know, I mean, in the end, the object is again liberated from its kind of trying to adapt itself to domestic surrounding. It's just this kind of object which is in itself fascinating or becoming fascinating. And maybe it's also this, yeah, for the spatial aspect of it, also, also the, the, the very device itself, you know, the very much the, 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 the object itself. So because in most of the movies we saw today, of course, there's it's the broadcasting and it's what happens on the TV behind the screen, let's say, or on the screen. Whereas when, when we start to talk about this object and well, what it does in the space, that's also an interesting angle to it, I think. Um, and liberating it a lot. But I would still I mean, not buy any. The, um, but I mean, I think it's interesting that we still fixate on the object when actually still the prevalent thing of television today is the territory. And it's, it's expansion of the territory. I mean, what I was trying, and I think this is something that maybe, um, well, would have been interesting. Um, 
uh, to expand it outside of the scale of the building or the space to the territorial. I mean, uh, still in the US, what I was trying to get at is, uh, well, you have what is called Sinclair, which is the most right wing media that basically every red state and basically over the last 15 years, uh, uh, something like this, they've just been buying up everything in the in the periphery, in the in the red zone, in the countryside. You know the the the, the Trumpsters, and this is not only happening uh, in the U.S., but it's also what is ha you know uh, you know Brexit is Rupert Murdoch's big pet project. You know, buying you know starting with Sky TV. Anyway, so let's say there are these infrastructural components to television that still make television, I would say, not an obsolete medium uh, in the transmission of, uh, uh, um, yeah, power, control, knowledge. Uh, yeah, let, I would actually prefer to use the word knowledge because it's still, you know, there are different forms of knowledge, ones that we would all agree with on the screen because I think we probably share an ethos uh, I hope a political ethos and cultural ethos vision of the world, whereas uh, this is still, and that I think is something that, um, yeah, we should just look at and and consider. It is a it is a utility, you know. Uh, and how do we uh, engage with TV uh, in that way as still um, a vital. Um, uh, as something that is vital and relevant. It has defined us. Uh, it has defined what has happened. Uh, you know, somebody mentioned, uh, yeah, 9 11 is the last media event. But I mean, you know, we can, I would argue that 9 11, yes, I mean, I did not watch, I watched one tower live and the other on the CNN website, you know, <laughs> sitting inside. I mean, I remember that quite clearly, which was like a thing, you know, like, going to a website that was like a new thing to go to CNN.com. But anyways, this idea that post 9-11, so the last 20 years, there has been still a shift uh, that has made uh, yeah, television more relevant than ever, but maybe it is the interface that has then uh, mm. uh, changed. The interface or, or, the, or the reduction of the, the um, yeah, of the object of the of the machine itself, but it still is a control, um, all right, it's a knowledge producer. I wanna keep saying that, it's a knowledge producer. We don't wanna go into the rhetoric of control. It's just, it's producing knowledge and it's either, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's just different forms of knowledge. Anyways. I think the example that uh, we had on um, capsules uh, on the capsule um, about democracy, uh, the um, revolution in Yugoslavia, how they try just to connect to this uh, to the vision room to say that the revolution happened because the part of people still didn't know what's what's happening. So it's like really how to communicate with uh, like the like the audience that is like the scale of the city or the country. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I think we should also not undermine the power of local TV, uh, you know, in producing this knowledge that I think Solomon is referring to. I recently watched uh, John Oliver's uh, program uh, last week uh, tonight, I think is, is the name, talking about uh, sponsored content. And he, in fact, um, I don't remember which local TV, but he faked a, 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 a sexual blanket that was a product in the market. And oh, this was featured in the, one of the main... Uh, programs and, and this body of experts that we actually rely on TV. And I think Asli was talking about this idea of going on TV as something that is kind of legitimizes one's uh, uh, somehow expertise or, uh, you know, efficiency or uh, um, liability or whatever you, you, you want to advertise. And he was just showing how this absurd uh, narrative about the blanket was in the, you know, made headlines in this TV show because it was sponsored content and, and not always uh, identify it as such. So I, I think we should not, I mean, if, uh, most of us, of course, uh, we, we this kind of idea of center periphery, I think that uh, Leah evoked uh, here and we have our, you know, we are somehow thinking from urban uh, or, you know, uh, uh, I would say um, 
instances of, uh, of understanding the television, but I think the local dimension is really not to be undermined, not only in, uh, you know, in the US, I would say, but also local in terms of the world periphery. And I would say in Brazil television, as I said, every bedroom of one who can afford would have a television. And uh, I'm, I'm, I come from the country of telenovelas and they're still very powerful. Mm. I mean, in this embedment of products, product placement, is something that is already there from the beginning of television. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always been there, rather it was a kind of sponsored, you know, so-and-so's hour, or why is it a soap opera in the US? Because literally it was dishwash, uh, sorry, laundry detergent for housewives, you know? Uh, you know, that was literally the, you know, the spot, you know, the advertisements or, you know, tobacco, uh, uh, companies, Mike Wallace, the famous 60 Minutes journalist, you know, he had a very famous interview program, smoking, uh, I don't know what it was, Lucky Strikes, something like this during the interview and then sponsored by, you know, so all these things. So in that sense, this is not something uh, that is new, but there was, let's say, regulations, yeah. at least in the US that changed that and then over recent years, again, really over the last 20, 25 years, that has also uh, deteriorated where you know yes. you could not have uh, literally product placement because it basically disenfranchised uh, uh, people. You know, so this kind of, you know, the, the regulatory commissions and things like this. Um, was there anything else where uh, we're about six minutes over our time. Leah, do you have a... I don't have anything else because I've been talking for the entire semester. So I think it's fine. I, I just wanted to ask Davide if he had uh, something to else because we haven't, you haven't said anything for a while. So I just, if, if you have something you want to add before we, before we say goodbye, or you don't have to, but... Uh... No, but actually uh, maybe I would like to simply uh, conclude by uh, with the way in which I think I opened my intervention in the time capsule, but I think it's uh, still emerging this, uh, this 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 problem that I think there's really nothing nostalgic or obsolete in speaking of television. In the end, this is an archaeology of a scopic regime that we still absolutely share today. Uh, I mean, of course, and if you think of the objects, I mean. The televisions today are, if, if the object television is a computer and computers are televisions, so it's very difficult for me to, to separate the, and have a taxonomy of different objects. It's simply a matter of uh, being uh, um, connected to some sort of real time transmission of uh, images, no? which is how television was born as an idea opposed to uh, cinema, which was recorded stuff, which we would see at a distance. So. Yeah, maybe the television set itself could be something uh, that belongs to the past, but the television as a medium is still very present. So this is why I think this is a very relevant seminar you've been teaching because it, it's, mm. it's speaking of today. And we, of course, we have to historicize a little bit the today to be able to discuss it. So looking at the television as the grandfather of Twitch and Instagram is perfect, in my opinion. The, um... Indeed. Thank you very much for that. Well, well I'd like to thank um, all the guests, um, all 10 of you for um, some great work in the midst of a very hectic time. We will continue in a few hours uh, with your next uh, final presentation for the next seminar on a roller coaster this week. Um, finally, I would just like to uh, thank Leah Catherine uh, three and a half years ago, something like this, when we mm -hmm. talked about how could she maybe be involved um, uh, in the Berlaga. Um, it came up while she was doing uh, this MTV project and then uh, we brainstormed together, well, what would be the kind of, um, what would be an interesting uh, uh, seminar? So, um, and I think it's been a pleasure to work together to kind of see, um, especially in the first couple of years, how something like that could um, evolve and how uh, what is always very important for me here is that we move things into what are the spatial implications. So, I mean, I am um, personally obsessed with uh, formats and mediums, 
but I find that a lot of the discourse within our realm of uh, architecture and urban design uh, never really spatializes some of these questions. And this is mm -hmm. as an overall um, attempt in the Berlaga pedagogy, something that is very important for me uh, to do. So thank you, Leah, for uh, uh, working with us on a, mm -hmm. let's say more meta project of how to evolve architectural mm -hmm. discourse. Um, and I look forward to, um, well, working with you to, uh, uh, yeah, see what happens with the next uh, trilogy of seminars, which will uh, be in another capacity for the coming years. So thank you very, uh, thank you very much. It's thank always you, a pleasure. Thank you, Solomon, and, and um, thank you to and, the students as well for a great uh, participation, although we've never met in person, but that might happen very, very soon. So let's see. Uh, but we did everything through, through screen, uh, obviously. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, and I think there, there's still somehow managed to be a level of intimacy. So that is yeah. a testament to your own character. So yeah. um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, Davide, Vanessa, and Asli. It is wonderful to see you. It's been way too long. So, yeah. Bye-bye, <laughs> um, yeah. guys. Bye. Until thank another you. moment. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, you wanted to stay. Yeah, right? it's okay. I told them. Uh, you, uh, okay. Yeah, that, so that you they stayed. Okay. Um, shall I? I made you. Let me make you host, and they can come back into this. Mm -hmm. Where do I do this? I think I am hosting. Uh, make. Now you are right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So I leave.